force here. Blackboard. My eyes adjusted so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Why is it? Oh, it's not giving me my sideboard. It's probably because it's such a small screen. It's presenting in a different way. Yeah. This is our semester. This is the 100. This is our course. There we go. All right. There you go. So if your computer screen is big enough, <laughs> it's going to show you the sidebar and then everything else on the other side. So all you have to do is click on start here and that gets the ball rolling. Except, let me go back. Uh, there are some things down here that you might be interested in. The New River email, you can from in, within Blackboard, you can send an email to anybody in the class plus the instructor without having to dig your way through the address book. You can't receive emails, but you can send them here. And there's your Zoom connection. Um, this is the instructor's view, so you're gonna see stuff that here that's not, maybe what I ought to do is, let's see, where is the, uh, there No, it's not over. I was looking for the, uh, the student view. Hmm. Well, okay. You're going to have to see stuff that I don't. <laughs> don't worry about it. I'll, I'll tell you if it's there or not when in your view. Okay. So you won't see this stuff right here. I don't use announcements, content, discussion groups, and all that stuff. We don't have time for that. We need to learn chemistry, not socialize. Uh, there's some tools. Yeah. I said that's great because the discussion space sucks. I had to use Blackboard for my, I took dual enrollment English yeah. last year. Yeah. Not that it was through here, but it's taught my teacher there. I had to use Blackboard for that class. Yes. And she, since it was English, we had to use discussion. <laughs> uh, most liberal, liberal arts teachers, instructors, they love the discussions. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Let's go. All right. Here we go. Now, what are we going to see? We're going to see um, there's a COVID blurb. You know, if you've been exposed, you got to report it still. There's the syllabus. Inside, inside that folder, you'll find a copy of the syllabus and the my schedule and everything's in PDF format. So you need a PDF reader. And I put a link down here, I think, to uh, here we go. PDF readers. You can get one from Adobe, you know, the creator of PDFs, or there's another one in here called Foxbit that works pretty good too. Uh, so let's go back up and see if I missed anything. Video resources, this is something IT put in everything. So I don't know what's there. Uh, Cengage, these are videos just to help you orient yourself to the homework and how Cengage works. You can watch them if you want. If, if you're already in and things are working for you, fine, you probably don't need it. This is, um, what is this? More videos. Okay, <laughs> on, on homework. I must have put these in here for a reason because uh, students have so much trouble with, with their homework, getting into homework and stuff. Okay, here's the knowledge test for your syllabus. It's a blackboard exam. So you just click on it. And um, if you're familiar with taking exam tests in blackboard, it looks like that. I'll click on it and show you. So there you go. And all you have to do is just say begin. And there, uh, there's some 
multiple choice and some fill in the blanks. So the fill in the blanks, the system won't grade them for me. So when you submit them, it'll sit there for a while until I get to it and grade it and give you credit. Um, and I think, let's cancel that. I used to have the learning modules uh, on the adaptive release, conditional release. So you had to complete one thing before the next one would open up. But I, I hope I've done away with that because I don't think we're going to need it in a face-to-face -face environment. Uh, but if you find that problem, let me know. You know, if you can't get into something, say, if you want to get into the first exam module and all the resources there and it won't open for you, then let me know. It's probably because I've got it. Well, I can check it here instead of talking about it. You just go down. Okay, here are your modules. Right. Module one is exam one, module two is exam two, and so forth. So let's see, let me look at this and adaptive release. No rules, okay. So I don't have adaptive release on these things, that's good. It's not gonna keep you from accessing the material. But the problem is, it's not gonna look like this. I've discovered that. This is the way the instructor sees it. But the way the students see it, when you do these learning modules, I wish I had known this in advance, I wouldn't have done it this way. The learning modules for students, um, you have to go to the, um, let's see. No, that's not it. There's a table of contents on the left that you'll see when you go in there. And you, you click on the various items in the table of contents to get what you need. So it's not listed like this. This is, this is just the way the instructor builds it. And if I have time, I'm going to do away with that and just put it in a folder so it looks the way I want it. Well, you know, that may be uh, a moot point because December we're, we're moving to D2L. Uh, was it Bright Space? It, it's a it's a different learning management system. I understand it's the same one that the public school system uses. So if you if you finished your degree recently, your high school degree recently, you should be familiar with D2L when you come into college. No, they didn't use it. We had Chromebooks, so we used Google Everything. Oh, okay, okay. And what I wanted to say was, if anyone uses Google Docs when you finish something. You have to download it as a either a Word document or PDF because Blackboard will not accept the Google Docs format. Okay. Okay. I remember I had to download every single thing I ever did in English because uh, she told us to do that because Blackboard did, does not like the uh, Google Docs format downloaded. I don't like Google Docs anymore. It's the only thing I had to use for all four years of high school, so it's mm -hmm. probably what I'm going to keep using. And I don't want to pay for Microsoft. Okay, so let me go back to the, the main menu. I'm getting ahead of myself going into that. Um, syllabus test, and then I've duplicated the course schedule here so you don't have to pull out your syllabus and look it up. Uh, let's see. You can get a free copy of Microsoft Office. If you need it, three, it's a 365. I put it on one of my computers simply because I, it, the version I had was really, really, really old. It was starting to not be compatible with other things. <clears throat> um, this is connection to your, your ebook. So once you're uh, properly registered, logged in with Cengage, then you can go straight to your ebook through this uh, folder. Um, this one I put out here to, this is where I would go to uh, open up Cengage for registration purposes. You could access your homework from here, but, but you have to scroll down through all of the various uh, products, chapters to find the one that you need. Um, if you go in through the module, then there's also a homework link down here. Let's see. Homework, here we go. So I set these up so that you can go straight into your chapter homework. 
Eocene's end of chapter. So these problems uh, here are derived from the end of chapter problems in the book. I used to do these. These are not available anymore. They're called masteries. I thought that it was a good idea the way they worked it, but um, in theory, it's good. In practice, it's not. So I, I cut those out. So you see them here, but you won't see them when you uh, go into your version. And, and you, about yep. Uh, when I was purchasing it, um, I don't have like the bank account or PayPal or anything. So my dad used Intel and it sent the stuff to his email. Oh. And it just said, uh, I don't know if he's allowed to like forward that to me or if it's going to be attached to my father's email instead. It might. Because like I, I, I said, I don't have like a bank account yet. Yeah. Um, what if you, um, I haven't forwarded it to your uh, New River account, okay. your New River email, and then uh, take that email that I sent you and look at the, the, the office hour contacts for Cengage and call them or connect with them and get an appointment during those office hours and take that information to them. And I, I've heard this before of previous students that do that, and they can fix it for you. Yeah. They'll make it work. Okay, uh, let's see. Where am I at? Supplemental documents, we'll not worry about those right now. Well, wait a minute, maybe we will. You won't need all these right away. These are naming documents. So this first two chapters, yeah, you may want to dig into those. Let's see, those are not available. These are naming acids and bases, ionic and covalent compounds, polyatomic ions. <clears throat> um, I should give you handouts on all of those anyway. But these, uh, everything that I hand out in class is in Blackboard too. So if you lose it or the dog eats your homework, you can go in and get another copy. Or if you miss a class one day and you miss getting the handouts, then you can always go in here. And, uh, and find them. Might be a treasure, huh? They're there. Or if you can't find what you're looking for, just give me a call and, and I'll track them down. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, yeah, okay. So now we can go into modules and see what they look like. Right. Uh, the navigation is gonna be a little bit different for you as a student. But you should have access to all this information uh, in some form uh, if you need it. So this this is just an outline of that chapter. These are the things that you're gonna that you should acquire skills on, knowledge of. Uh, so it, it's written in a form where all the ver all the verbs are action verbs. I think that's to satisfy Bloom's taxonomy. So. For you, education majors. No education majors here. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want. I took a couple of education courses as an undergraduate, thinking I might teach in high school. And I said, if this is education, I don't want anything. I don't want it. I mean, it was a total waste of time. Both courses. <laughs> so uh, I focused on content after that. I did teach high school one time after I got my PhD, uh, and it was a private school, so I can just imagine how much worse it would be in public schools. I mean, I'm, I'm still a teenager, and even I like teenagers suck. <laughs> yeah, that hormone toxicity really just <laughs> slips you I went backwards. To, doesn't it? I went to Green Bar East, uh, yeah, the public school right over there. And mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to teach there. You want to teach at the middle school even less. It's yeah, <laughs> Greenbrier East. Okay, is that the big one out toward with the hospital? Yeah, yeah, right okay. side. A friend of mine teaches at West, 
he teaches uh, chemistry there, and he's a basketball coach. If you're ever in that neighborhood, say hey to Jared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. Let's get on to here. Uh, okay, so um, this folder will have all the PowerPoint slides for that chapter. Right? So you have a PowerPoint version, right? You have Microsoft Office on your computer. You can view these, no problem. Uh, if you're somewhere where you don't have access to your PowerPoint uh, application, then you can look at the PDF version. Um, the, the difference, PDFs don't embed animations and videos. So that's a problem because I use those fairly often. But so I went out and bought a program that will convert my PowerPoints into HTML5 format. So you can view them in your browser. You just click on this thing right here. There it is. All the animations, all the videos embedded right there. And we may have to use this today. It just depends on whether I can get this computer to, to use my PowerPoints. If you won't, then that's our ticket. Okay, so those are those are the PowerPoints. They come in three flavors. Uh, let's see. Wait a minute. Let me go. Let me use this. Yeah, that's better. It's quicker. Okay, what else do I have in here? Well, there's some supplemental information. Uh, learn these elements. So that's the same thing that uh, I gave you, the periodic chart with marked off which ones I want you to learn. So there's that one if you need another copy of it. And these are the extra credit exercises. Um, I should have made copies of, maybe, oh, wait a minute. Did I make copies? Hold on a second. Well, they didn't make comments. Ah, here they are. One of them, uh, getting to know your periodic type. You know, instructions on the first place, first page, and um, blank periodic table on the second. So you need to get yourself some colored pencils and read the directions and fill out this periodic table. And that'll get you extra credit. Um, I think the value of the extra credit is both of these together count as one exam grade. Okay, so you get a lot of credit for it. Um, And the other one is this one. And this one won't mean anything to you right now, but it will. 50 ways to name your compound. This gives you practice naming compounds. And it gives you credit for it at the same time. Have you seen that before? <laughs> we did this like half the year. Oh, naming compounds? We, yeah, we did it for a really long time. Um, we're gonna, okay, by comparison, we're gonna breeze through it. So. That's what I heard that uh, she said, like, in the AP County, like, everything we're covering here is gonna be in, like, like, a couple weeks of college, like, everything in class. And yeah. I was like, oh, no. But I, I make it logical. I make it as logical as, as I can. So the way the rules are set up, uh, it's something that you can follow step by step. And we'll talk about that in nauseating detail when we get to it. Okay, uh, let's see. So here's module one review documents. All right, so I mentioned earlier those, those uh, review sessions that are scheduled, those days when we do nothing but review. This is the basis for those reviews, these documents. So what you'll see when you pull up one of these documents is uh, it has the exact appearance of an exam. It looks exactly like the exams that I'm gonna hand out. So it's, there's no surprises. If you use this review document to review, it's gonna look like this as soon as it comes up, there you go. So this one will say exam one without the review statement. And then the questions below it. 
Yeah, it won't say this review thing in there, but it'll it'll look like this. Um, but what a lot of my students do is they take these review documents, they print them out, or they do it on their computer, and they they fill in the the answers here, like uh, A, you know, and then they might go to this one and type in B. The only thing about this form is you can't save it. So once you get there, uh, keep it up. Hope the power doesn't go out <laughs> or print it off or print off a hard copy and use it like a test. And they, they go through it and they take it just like a test. And then they go back and use the, the key that is right here. Okay. That's got all the answers in it. And you can, you can check yourself and then focus on the ones where you have trouble. And if you can't figure out how to answer a problem, it's no way it just doesn't make sense. That's what you bring to class on the review day. And we hammer that up and get it done. Now, uh, I also give you an alternate way to understand how things are done. This work problem stuff. It's in my handwriting. <laughs> so I took each of the problems and I worked it out, except for the ones that just require just rote memorization. If that's all that's required, I don't waste my time on it. But if there's some uh, explanation that will help understanding that problem, I've put it in here. I didn't do this overnight. You know, it, it took me several semesters to get all my classes done this way. But it also helped me understand how to convey ideas to my classes. So it wasn't a wasted effort. Uh, and that document will just go down and notice how the numbering system, this one is chapter one, number nine. So since this exam covers two chapters, then you'll go down here further and you'll see it change to C2, hopefully. Let's go down, 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 down. There are lots of them. <laughs> there you go. So now you're into chapter two. I give you lots of problems to work. That doesn't mean that you have to work all of them. Work as many as you can. And if you're limited on time, then uh, don't take them in order. Don't go one, two, three, four, because there's lots of repetition. Take maybe all the evens or all the odds and whatever it takes to get through to the end. So you get exposure on every idea. And then if you have time, go back and catch the ones that you, you and that's, for this document and for the review document itself, do it that way uh, if, if you don't have enough time. Is this how long the, the exams mm -hmm. are going to be? I'm sorry? Is this how long the exams are going to be? No, no, no. These, this many problems, no, there wouldn't be enough time to do all of those. This is the type of problem that you'll see on the exam. Okay, so is it going to be more like 50? Something like that, yeah. It's, it's manageable. Yeah. Uh, and I've taught this course several years, so I've sort of got a feel now for what a student can handle in one exam sitting. So maybe in the beginning, I put too many problems in, right? So you weren't among the unlucky beginners <laughs> for me to test on. So later classes have the advantage of, of uh, by knowing now how many problems to put in a test and what types of problems also. Uh, most of them are gonna be multiple choice because they grade faster. And if you write your multiple choice questions correctly, uh, you can gain just about the same kind of information about a student's knowledge uh, with a multiple choice as you can with a, a short answer or uh, fill in the blank or that type of stuff. But they do, I do have them in here. Some problems you just, you just have to work. You can't do multiple choice and, and gain the type of information that an instructor needs. Okay, so that you'll see that in every module. It'll look exactly like that. And also, let me go to the bottom. Um, keep going, keep going. There we go. All right, let's scroll to where it begins. Useful information. Uh, this information uh, will give you things like uh, conversion factors, uh, certain values, and some formulas. 
And for the first two chapters, it's going to be short, right? But I don't throw these away and then start a new useful information for the next exam. I just add them to it, right? Because you may need these later also. So what you need to do is when you look through these, this useful information is know where everything is and what it means. Like, what does that formula mean? I don't tell you what it is, but that's, that's a conversion formula from centigrade temperature to Fahrenheit temperature. Okay? So you have to recognize what it is. I mean, I'm not going to spoon feed you, right? Um, but you don't have to memorize those formulas. Now, if you work enough problems using that stuff, you will automatically memorize it. But it's there as sort of a, uh, a stress reliever. Uh, other things that I put in here, I don't know why I kept that one in there, uh, for making conversions from one unit to another. There's, there's a better way than that. But some, I think in the beginning, some of my students came out of high school using this type of method. So I stuck it in there to help them through. Yeah. She taught us how to, I don't remember what it's called, but the, uh, it looks kind of like brushes, especially for moles mm -hmm. for converting yeah. from like number of atoms uh -huh. to moles. Mm -hmm. We did that where you had to put one on top and then you put the same unit here and you yeah. I don't remember what it's called, but was that a um let's see what they call it? The pink and fence model. Uh, where she drew it out like this. Called it. Like that. Yeah, that. but it was that. Put something there, and then if it's over here, it cancels that one. Yes. Yeah. That's what she taught us to do. Yeah, that okay. That's fine. You can use that method. I use parentheses. She said it wasn't said it would help us a lot. Okay. Okay. And sure. It did, especially for, for converting moles and stuff. Okay. Um, and here's a list of polyatomic ions, you know, so you don't have to memorize them. You just have to recognize them. And we'll, we'll talk about those when we get to that point in the chapter. And there's a periodic table. So you won't have that periodic table in here, but you'll have this periodic table. And um, notice that it's, it's missing some elements down here, but my periodic table has all the names in here. You're not going to need them, except when you start to fill in your uh, extra credit. Right? You won't want to use these uh, space filters, these space holders, because this is, this is it's, it's a stupid name, just to fill the space. Like this uh, 111, this uh, atomic number 111, that's un un unium, right? <laughs> that's, that's the placeholder name for that element. Now it has a real name. I don't know what it is. One eleven. It's on your table somewhere. Oh, but you notice that those that I want you to memorize, they don't have the names in there. Right? So you got to look those up. And there's no names here because some of the questions require you to to know the name from the symbol. And if I just give it to you, you know that kind of defeats the purpose of the question. <clears throat> okay, so that's what uh, chapter one and two exam one useful information and the the copy that i give you for the exam will have those pages on the back the exact same pages so if you learn how to work your way around those then you'll be familiar with them when the exam drops in your lap okay uh made that point let's leave that page let's see repeat that repeat that um, I'm going to leave that one up there in case I, I have to use it. Okay. Let's see. Back to Blackboard and see if I missed anything. Where is it? Here it is. All right. So those are all the modules. Practice tests. Some of my students like, like Blackboard tests because they'll, they'll grade the test for you. I think that they're all multiple choice. They'll grade the test for you and tell you which ones you missed and you can go back and drill them. <clears throat> you don't have to use them. It's just if you like that way of doing things. Um, but it'll cover the, the same materials as the uh, review document. I like the review document better because it, it's, it's something you can hold in your hands and uh, 
circle of ones that are giving you problems and you just can't figure it out. And we'll tackle those first on the review day. And then once we've covered all of those, if there's any time left, then I'll just start rattling on about something. I'll rattle, I'll rattle on about that chapters, uh, that exams material, of course. Okay, all this stuff down here is extra. Uh, oh, uh, end of chapter problems in your textbook. These are all the solutions. Actually, I shouldn't say solutions. They're just answers. They just tell you what the answers are. Uh, in your textbook, what they usually do is do all the odds or evens. Answers in the back. And I always hated that. So the one I want to know is the even one that you didn't answer. So here, since I'm the instructor, I got hold of all of them. It might be for a different version than the 10th edition, though. That's, that's the problem. And the, the numbers might not line up. So it might take some uh, detective work if you want to use that to find out which one's which. But if you're limited on time, focus all your efforts on the review document. Yeah. Hint, hint. Okay, so that's Blackboard. And now I think we can actually, it's almost 10.30. Let me check myself, see how we're doing. 10.30, 11.30, okay. We're only going to cover one chapter, so I think we've got time to do it. So let me see if I can get PowerPoints to come up. Uh, let's close that. Let's close that. Let's save it. And let's see if I can get PowerPoint to load. I'm told that this is the first time this computer has been started since the pandemic. And they've updated, they've done some things to it, so it may not work. Yeah. I don't. Okay, let me try. Let's just try. It's, it's better if we can work from the uh, PowerPoint application than it is from the uh, HTML. Looks like it's doing something. You get seeing my file system too. I have to drill down. Let's see, there it is. Sam one. Check it. All right, it worked. Okay, let's make a slideshow out of it. Chemical foundations. Let me pull this out. I got this is the whole course, the entire course, I think, in a three ring binder. Okay. Yeah. And this gives me a chance to see where I'm headed with these topics. We can bleed over a little bit into uh, the lab time if we need to. We, we do have a lab. You all got a copy of that. So we are going to do a lab today, but it's, it's not a, a wet chemistry lab. It's kind of busy work. Okay. So let me get my, my partner out here. See if it'll work. Yep, <laughs> seems to be working. Okay. We all gotta start somewhere. So we're gonna start with chemical foundations. Get started. All right. <clears throat> First of all, you know, words just don't appear out of the blue most of the time, unless you're in government and you sort of invent words to, to get votes. But in sciences, words have definite meanings. Uh, I say definite, sometimes they're, they're broadly applied, uh, like chemistry. What is, what is chemistry? Well, chemistry is uh, in a nutshell, is the study of substances, which is covers everything, and how one substance changes into another substance. We keep it broad because we haven't defined what those substances are yet. <clears throat> um, and in doing so, there's a there's an intuitive connection 
that if you're in chemistry long enough, there's an intuitive connection between what you observe on the surface, the macroscopic world, and what's going on underneath the microscopic level. So if, if you, you know that you're beginning to understand something about chemistry uh, at a visceral level, when you can make that intuitive connection between what you observe and you say, oh, the color changed in this reaction. I bet that's because on the microscopic level happened. That's the connection you want to look for for your best understanding. So we have to talk about the chemistry in terms of uh, atoms and molecules and what's going on at, at the unseen level. <clears throat> for instance, uh, when we say atom, of course, it's the, the, the smallest part of an element that can exist and still retain the identity of the element, right? So oxygen atom is the smallest part of the oxygen element that you can have. And when we put those, when we put uh, one or more of these together, bound together uh, in such a way that the, the combination acts with a different identity than the elements from which it's made, then we have a molecule. Right? So we put one of these together with two of those. Now we have a water molecule, right? oxygen and hydrogen. I saw this or read this thing, it must have been on the internet. It was a whole blurb about the toxicity of this new element. They call it dihydrogen oxide. <laughs> and it's it's like it was a it was a, a fear blur. And the hydrogen oxide will, will kill us all one day. They were talking about water. I think they were making fun of the uh, of other real fear mongers that were trying to make us be afraid of chemistry. Okay, so I digress again. <clears throat> uh, we could put uh, two oxygen atoms together and make an oxygen molecule, or we could put two hydrogen together and make a uh, hydrogen molecule. In fact, this um, periodic table that I handed out, you'll notice that some of the elements have uh, blue boxes around. Right? Those are the elements that at room temperature and at one atmosphere pressure exist as diatomic molecules. So the element is diatomic. Right? So you'll notice that it's, well, I've got a periodic table up here too. So hydrogen here, uh, oxygen, no, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iron. Those are all diatomic elements. Now they can exist in other forms, but the, the common form in at one atmosphere pressure and room temperature is diatomic. So that's important to remember when you uh, are confronted with a word problem that says uh, oxygen reacts with hydrogen or reacts with something else. And it doesn't tell you anything else about it except in words. Then you should know that when you, if you have to go write a chemical equation for that reaction, that the oxygen has to be O2. If you don't write it O2, then your equation will never balance. Okay, so those are molecules. They behave as single units. Um, so a chemical reaction will look something like this, and this is uh, an expanded version. Right? You'll notice that the reactants are on this side, then you have an arrow, and then the products are on that side. That's convention. We write right, left to right. This is not uh, China, some other country where they do things backwards and upside down, up to down. We don't write our equations uh, from right to left and top to bottom. This is the convention. So you're going to have uh, two water molecules. And if you run a direct current through them, uh, then you can split these atoms apart from their, these molecules, and they'll recombine. So these two oxygens will recombine into those, this molecule, and these four hydrogens will recombine into two hydrogen molecules. 
That's called uh, electrolysis. I used to have a device when I when I did that one year stint in purgatory. Actually, it was a private school in Georgia. <clears throat> we had a device with a double stem on it and a uh, power supply, and it would uh, you put your water in there, and you'd add a little bit of acid in it to make it conductive, and then you hook up the power supply, and pretty soon you'd have bubbles coming out of one side and the other, and it'd move up the tubes, and you could collect it at the top. You just put a test tube over the top and collect it. And uh, take one of them out and stick a, uh, a lighted match or actually a glowing amber in there. And if it was hydrogen, it would pop. And that always got used in the class. But it was, uh, this reaction was taking place. In fact, if you've got uh, some water, uh, distilled water is better. And then you just put a couple of drops of lemon juice in it. Then uh, drop a nine volt battery one that's got a charge. And from each of the electrodes, you'll start to see bubbles. It's that reaction. Okay. So what is science really? Not what popular media tells you it is. Uh, I mentioned words. Words have meaning. The root word for science, if you go back as far as the Greek, you find that it could mean a couple of different things. Uh, one, it could mean knowledge. Uh, but there's another meaning for science called truth. Now, of course, uh, if you watch Indiana Jones, what did he say? And if you want truth, uh, philosophy class down the hall. Okay. okay, I'm making a reference to a movie nobody's ever seen. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, my apologies. So uh, in our case, knowledge will have to suffice. So science uh, in reality is the search for knowledge and how to organize knowledge to make sense of the natural world. Uh, I also tell my students, uh, nature just does what it does. Right? If we weren't here, it would still be doing what it does. Um, uh, our problem is uh, running to catch up, trying to figure out why it does that to learn about how to wrap our brains around uh, the natural world. That's what science is supposed to help us do. <clears throat> so uh, in effect, science is a framework for gaining and organizing this knowledge. And it depends on the discipline. Uh, chemistry has lots of different branches. And other sciences, they have lots of different branches. And over time, they figured out how to use this overall framework and the particulars of how it works best for their discipline, right? So you might go from one discipline, and they do it this way, go another, do it a different way. But overall, uh, it, it's trying to gain knowledge and organize that knowledge in an understandable fashion. Um, so with that being said, science can be viewed as a plan of action, you know, step by step. This is this is generally what you're going to do to gain that knowledge and to validate it. And when I say validate it, in other words, you've got to convince other scientists in your discipline that what you're saying has merit. If they don't believe it has merit, then it's probably going to die on the vine. And that's one of the purposes of referee journals. You know, if you want to publish your work and make it known to other scientists, it has to pass an editorial committee. You know, the editor and the editor has um, reviewers that they send their these articles out to. I was a reviewer for several, not a lot, but a few articles because of my the discipline, the place that I spent most of my time and worked in. So they sent me uh, from time to time uh, articles to review, and I, I marked them up and made my comments and sent them back, and you know they can take it or leave it. Um, but it's a plan of action. And then um, when, when you hear this phrase, settled science, you should instantly reject it. There's no such thing as settled science. There is um, agreed upon 
knowledge. And uh, only for a time, because it may be valid for now, but in the future, um, scientists are, are by nature skeptical persons. If they're not skeptical, they got no business being scientists. <clears throat> and that's one of the purpose for publishing and keeping good notes yourself, because uh, anybody that comes along behind you should be able to take your work and duplicate it. If it can't be duplicated, then it doesn't comport with the natural world, because the natural world is only going to do things one way under the given circumstances that you're describing. So um, you've got to be open to challenge from other scientists. I mean, you can't have a thin skin and be a scientist. You got to be able to support your arguments. And that's, I, I tell people, um, I endured seven years of research and then examinations to get my PhD. It's a test of character more than it is a test of knowledge. You gotta stand up and defend your position and do it with evidence, right? And that continues into your professional career. So when, when people try to tell you settle science, they're probably have an agenda, right? They want, they want to blame changes in our climate on human activity, and it just doesn't fit the data, right? They used to call it global warming. Uh, that didn't work. So now they call it global climate change. And it's just a bunch of bunk, in my opinion. And since I'm a skeptical scientist, I'm allowed to say that. <clears throat> OK, um, so th there is a method that you can follow. And this is an outline of that method. Right? And it's been followed for centuries. From the time of, uh, uh, let's see, John Dalton back in the 1600s, um, the inquiry has matured, of course, over time. And it usually starts with an observation, right? Nature's just doing what it does, and the curious person notices something. So they wonder, you know, what's going to happen next? Or why does that happen? That's the observation. And then you formulate an explanation for that phenomenon that you just observed. And if you, if you uh, formulate it correctly in this form as a hypothesis, you're saying, okay, this is what I observed and this is why it happened. Or uh, this is what I observed and this is what's going to happen next. In that statement. If it's written correctly, then you can test it. And the testing, it just runs the gamut. It depends on the question as what kind of test you're going to impose on it to uh, test your experiment, okay? And you get results from the experiment. Then you have to think, right? What did the experiment tell me about this observation based on my hypothesis? Then you, you, that's your critical thinking skill there. You, know, you break it apart and say, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? And usually when you get to this point, you start analyzing your data. Uh, you have a, a dozen at least other questions that pop up. So you take your pick. It's, in the sciences, it's called job security. There's always more work to do. But this goes in a loop. So once you've analyzed your data from this experiment, you say, okay, let me make another observation based on what I know. So you may be able to tweak the conditions a little bit. Maybe you take what you've observed from nature and you put it in a more controlled environment. So my discipline is uh, agronomy, which is crops and soils. And I focused on soils and plant nutrition. So sometimes we'd observe something in the, in the field and say, okay, um, We'll go out one day and we'll dig up about, um, you know, 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds of soil and put it in a barrel at the back of our truck and take it back to the college. And then we'll take that soil, we'll sift it, you know, make it uh, uniform, and then we'll pot it. 
and grow plants in it. And say under more controlled environment. So we can maybe uh, tease some information from the observed field evidence. So uh, it goes in a circle. You experiment, you analyze your data, you make more observations, experiment, and you just keep going in a circle. So you don't do that forever. Eventually, you have to say something definite about what you're doing. So let's see, do I have that? Well, it's not in this slide. But I usually have a, an arrow down here with the law. The difference between law and theory. Well, I got a slide, so I don't have to write it up there. Um, so let's go to the next slide. We'll come back to this one. What I want to do is make a comment about laws. Laws simply say that under this condition, this is what happens. That's it. I don't say anything about why. I just say, if you observe this under these conditions, you'll get these results every time. That's a law. Sometimes a law is a mathematical expression. Sometimes it's, it's just a sentence, like Newton's first law of, of motion. Objects tend to remain at rest unless acted upon by an external force. Or if they're moving, they tend to move indefinitely in a straight line until an external force acts upon them. That's, that's a state. His second law is a formula. It's F equals MA. Force equals mass times acceleration. Right? So it can come in different forms, but it, it doesn't say anything about why that happens. That's the way laws are. It's their nature. <clears throat> and they're very restrictive. You have to apply specific conditions to get these results. Um, but if you go back, let's see, let me go back. Okay. If after so many experiments, and very often you formulate a law and you use that law over and over again, you may decide that you want to experiment and try to explain why something happens. All right. We're going to talk about that at some point, the kinetic molecular theory of gases. It explains why gases behave the way they do. It's a theory, and there's a model that usually goes with it. I like when I hear model, I think of uh, airplane models or battleship models. You know, they're not the real thing. They're representations of reality. And um, if you have a model, then usually you can, you can take it apart or you can change something in it and see how it affects. So, so if you have a model, uh, you have a little bit more power than you do if you're just formulating a law. So uh, the theory then allows you to predict what will happen if you change conditions. Whereas a law, you can't change conditions. So this predictive value means that theories are actually more powerful than laws. And then you experiment again. You made a prediction. Well, okay, let's formulate a hypothesis that incorporates that uh, change in the prediction and do another experiment. So what happens if you, you go this, through this procedure and your theory has been holding up pretty good, explains why things happen, and then you do an experiment and it just falls apart. It doesn't predict properly what's going to happen. So what do you do then? We have three choices. If your theory falls apart, then your first choice is um, restricted use. Okay, It doesn't work with that change. So don't do that change anymore. So restricted use. I had a saxophone teacher that uh, bless his heart. He was trying to teach me how to play saxophone, and I, I had a beard then too. So I'd have the mouthpiece in my mouth. It's covered by hair, and he'd hear something that wasn't right. He'd say, "I know it's coming from your embouchure, but I can't tell what you're doing because you got all that hair." So he says. Whatever you did, don't do that. So restricted use. Don't do that. You know, don't do, don't do that again. <clears throat> so what are your oh, what are your other choices? Well, you can either restricted use 
or you can modify it. You can change the conditions of your model so that it will it will work for both the, the old predictions and conditions and the new ones. And that's done a lot. It tends to make the model more complicated over time. Right? So there's a limit to how much of that you can do. And usually, if you do so much of it that it's just a, a convoluted mess, then you're left with your last option. Um, throw it out. Start over. And that happens. Now, restricted use uh, is the difference between uh, classical physics, the Newtonian physics, and uh, relativistic physics, the Einstein version. Right? If the masses get too big, then Newtonian physics just falls apart. And that's where you need uh, Einstein and relativity. But what, what about the other direction? When things get really small, that's where we're operating in chemistry. Things get really, really small, then Newtonian physics doesn't work there either. And Einstein doesn't work there either. So you need quantum mechanics. Then. So you need three different theories to explain the whole range of, of sizes in the universe, at least until we get a unified theory. They're still working on that. They've got sort of interim unified theories, but uh, nothing great enough to uh, for me to teach it. Okay, let's put it that way. Okay. So what do we got next? <clears throat> so there's your hypothesis. It's possible explanation for the observations we mentioned that earlier. And your model, right? And your models can be models can be physical, right? You can have uh, models of uh, molecules, right? If we took, if you took my organic course, I haven't taught it in a couple of years because nobody wants to take it. <laughs> but we have uh, models because a lot of organic chemistry is three dimensional, understanding the three dimensional arrangement of atoms in space and how they interact with others. Um, so there's a physical model there, uh, or the model can be mathematical. So when I did research on the crop responses to fertilizers, then the model there would say, all right, if I put this much of a certain fertilizer on this soil, and I know the soil's starting conditions, right, what's its fertility, then I should get this response in the crop. And you can express that in a mathematical form. <clears throat> you statistics. Okay. So um, whenever we want to make those observations, uh, in the scientific method, you're going to make a measurement of some kind, usually. Uh, sometimes you just make observations, like qualitative information. Like, does it turn blue? No. Does it get bigger? Um, does it completely lose its structure? Like, if you take a solid and heat it, it just go like that. So that's an observation. But science can only go so far with qualitative information. Eventually, you're going to need quantitative. And that means numbers. When you make a measurement of some kind, you're going to have both the magnitude or the number, and you're going to have a unit of measure. Because if I say I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, okay, hold on a second. I am 71. What does that mean? Well, it could mean I'm 71 years old. Actually, not quite. I'm pushing it, but I'm not there yet. Or it could mean my height. If the units are inches, that could be 71 inches, which is the truth. So if I wanted to convey the complete information, I should have said 71 inches, both the magnitude and the unit of measure. That's required for a measurement in any of the sciences. And in common discussions, you need that information. It's just 
assume. I wouldn't go around telling people I'm 71. They probably automatically think I'm 71 years old, right? So your mind sort of fills in the answers. But in the sciences, you can't afford to do that. You've got to have both the number and the, the unit of measure. For example, 20 grams, right? So if you know what a gram is, that's a mass, then you've got 20 of them. Um, but units of measure can also be compound, right? Here you have 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So joule is a measure of energy. And second, of course, is a measure of time. So this is probably a derived observation. We'll talk about that a little more later. When we get to dimensional analysis, did they call it that in high school? Okay, yeah, it's unit conversions. <clears throat> okay, so there are fundamental units that have to be agreed upon by all scientists so that we're, we're talking about the same thing. If I say one kilogram, then uh, you should understand what I mean by one kilogram. So we have to we have to nail it down. We have to say, all right, this is one kilogram forever and always. And that's a fundamental unit of mass, the kilogram. In fact, there's a, a platinum iridium cylinder in a double bell jar with inert gas in it stored somewhere in France. I used to be in a cave because temperature is stable. Uh, and if you wanted to standardize your kilogram, you have to send it over there and they would compare it to the standard and say, all right, ours is exactly one kilogram. Yours is 0 0.999998 kilogram. Right, you're close, but no cigar. <clears throat> uh, length is the meter. And we're talking about metric system here. That's, that's science, metric system. Of course, in agriculture, where I, where I come from, you have to be fluent in both, both the empirical system and metric system, because farmers work in um, acres and the yields of their crop, like bushels per acre, stuff like that. So you, you had to make conversions back and forth. When you published your work in the scientific article, it was in the metric system. But if it was in a, if you were publishing it for, uh, popular consumption among farmers, you have to make all your conversions into the English system. Okay, so that length meter is a standard. And the meter was, at one time, it was based upon the distance between the equator and the North Pole. Uh, as that distance from the, the equator through Greenwich, England, to the North Pole. Why do I say Greenwich? Because that's the prime meridian. For, for longitude, measuring how far around the earth you are, starts at Greenwich, England. That's the zero mark. So they took it from the equator through Greenwich to the North Pole, and then they subdivided it. So how did they know? Well, they just wanted to subdivide it enough so they'd have a convenient measure like, like this. And that's the meter. Well, we've since standardized it even further. And now, if you have the equipment, you can create the meter in your lab with, uh, with your instrument, as long as it can measure so many wavelengths of a laser beam coming from a particular element. It's, so that's the new definition. So you don't have to send your meter over to France and have them compare it with that bar. Okay, second, um, it's an astronomical unit and we sort of grandfathered in. So we just had to define it in terms of actually oscillations of uh, an isotope of cesium, I think it is. The atomic clock, you've heard of that. So that determines what the second is. Temperature. Temperature is the Kelvin. Now, the Kelvin is the same size degree as Celsius. It just has a different starting point, and we'll talk about that subsequently. Electric current, well, we talked about that a little bit. I'm not even sure if we do it in this semester. Maybe it's in the second semester. The ampere. The ampere is actually how many coulombs of charge pass a point in one second. 
That's one coulomb per second. This is down here. But this is the fundamental unit. Amount of substance, we already use that a lot. The mole. The mole is that just a number. And what's funny to me is uh, this is the full, this is the whole word, and this is the abbreviation. You just drop the E. Uh, luminosity, we're not going to deal with candelas at all. So you don't have to worry about those. Those are all fun units. Everything else is derived. Now, very often we use units that are not fundamental, but they're more convenient. Uh, and we understand that the kilogram is the standard, but we usually talk in terms of grams. The grams is a thousand, uh, thousands of a kilogram. Now, sometimes we want to use uh, different sized units so that the number is not so big or so small. So these are the prefixes. So you put any of these prefixes in front of the fundamental unit, and it changes the unit based upon this value. So let's see, where is that? Everybody knows gigabytes, right? In your computer. So a gigabyte is uh, a billion bytes. Okay. Or a megabyte. Kilobytes and megabytes is what I started with in computers. <laughs> They've since grown quite a bit. So now actually we're up, we're up to terabytes. But you can buy hard drives, uh, storage that's in terabytes. And it's pretty cheap. I mean, you get, where is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So connected to my computer. It's a little USB drive and it'll hold one terabyte of data. And it's just that big. It's amazing. Anyway, these prefixes modify the fundamental by this amount. So a kilo gram is a thousand grams. Now, why did they use the kilogram as the standard measure and not grams? Why did they have to use that one? Well, think about it. What would happen if that standard uh, platinum meridium cylinder were a gram? It would be about that big. If somebody got a fingerprint on it, or a scratch it or it corroded, that would be, percentage-wise, would be a huge change. And that will never do. So they said, we need something bigger. Well, the gram was already established. The CGS system killed the um, gram second, what's the first one? Centimeter, centimeter gram second was uh, predating just this SI system. So I said, okay, the gram's already here, it's here to stay. So we'll just take a thousand of it and that'll make a cylinder, you know, big enough. So that if a slight corrosion occurs, it won't affect the, uh, the value, the, the, the massive value that much. So that's why the kilogram instead of the gram is a fundamental unit. But we tend to weigh things in terms of grams. Well, it's not there. Like on that analytical balance, it gives you the value in grams, not kilograms. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, you can go big. These are these are big, and this comes straight out of your book. Or you can go small. Like these are the prefixes for small. Right? Everybody knows nanotechnology. Nano just means 10 to the minus ninth. It's a, 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 it's a billionth of whatever. Like a nanogram would be a dip billionth of a gram. That's pretty small. Or uh, a nanofiber in your uh, leotards, your exercise pants or whatever, is uh, uh, the size of a nanometer, a billionth of a meter. Very small particles. Um, in the uh, atomic sciences, very, very often we, we use things like pico, pento, so they're even smaller. But these are the exponential notations for that. And we haven't even talked about that, but we will. Um, the metric system is, is decimal based. Each time you move the decimal point in your number, you're going a factor of 10, either bigger or smaller. And that's actually the beauty of a metric system. Okay, so you need to know those. You need to know some of those. Let's see. Uh, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano. That's probably enough for that one. 
And then if we go back, uh, you know, need to know, definitely need to know kilo and mega probably. There might be a question or two in the review document on hecta. hecta. Okay. Uh, let's see, did I go too far? No, okay. So here's the thing. This concept trips up a lot of new newcomers to the sciences. The difference between mass and weight. Mass is a measure of how much of the substance there is. It changes nowhere in the universe. If you've got a kilogram here on the Earth, you've got a kilogram on the surface of the moon. If you've got a kilogram on Mars, it's amount of substance. It does not change uh, depending on the forces of gravity. Right? We've heard the term one G, one G, right? On the surface of the Earth, we're experiencing one G of gravity. On the moon, it's a sixth of a G. So what happens with that gram? Well, on the Earth, that that was excuse me, kilogram, that kilogram has a, a definite weight. It's applying a force against the surface. So you sit it on the table, it's pushing down with a force uh, that's determined by the kilogram. But it's a certain force. And of course, the table's pushing back. That's Newton's third law. Um, but on the moon, it's pushing down with a sixth of the force that it would be on the surface of the Earth. That's weight. So there's a difference between mass and weight. Uh, mass can be measured in terms of motion. So that's what uh, Newton was talking about with his second law. Uh, a certain amount of mass, if it's accelerating at so many meters per second squared, right? Acceleration is a change in velocity. So meters per second is velocity, meters per second squared is the change of velocity over time. So if it's speeding up, that means the velocity is changing. And if it's got a certain mass, then we know that it's gonna require that much force. To do it. So anywhere in the universe, that mass accelerating this much is going to take that much force. Okay, and you can interpret that uh, in a gravity well too on the surface of the Earth. So if it's uh, uh, one kilogram and it's accelerating at nine point eight meters per second squared in the gravity field of the Earth then the force will be uh, one newton. Right? So if this is a kilogram, one kilogram, and it's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared, this is one newton, right? So this is a derived unit. This is a fundamental unit. That's a fundamental unit. That's a fundamental unit. And this is derived from those units. So one newton is actually kilogram meters per second squared. It's important to know these conversions because if you do dimensional analysis and you have to make conversions, then uh, putting a Newton in there won't work if the other components of the calculation are kilograms, meters, and seconds. And you don't know how to cancel it. So you have to know that a Newton is a kilogram, meter per second squared. Then you can, you can do the dimensional analysis. Okay. Uncertainty. Let's see how am I doing on time? I'm talking too long, of course. <clears throat> Uncertainty. This is something that is might be difficult to wrap your head around, uh, but it's it's a concept that has to be mastered. Uncertainty in measurement. Every time you make a measure, there is some uncertainty in your measure. You know, the different reasons for the uncertainty. But if you think that you've measured something to be a meter long, maybe, maybe it's a meter, maybe it's a little shorter than a meter in reality, maybe it's a little longer than a meter in reality. You have to recognize that your measurement is has built in uncertainty. 
Okay, so we need a way to express that, that all scientists agree upon. Okay, so what we do is when we report a measurement, we agree that there, the digits in that measurement are all certain except for the last one to the right. That's the uncertain one. So let's see, we have an example. Yeah, so if we're going to make a measurement here. Um, that's a little small, but okay, we blew it up over here. So on, on this burette, that's probably a bad example because burettes, they measure from small to large going the wrong direction, going down. It's small at the top and large at the bottom. So you have to be sure to read it the right direction. So this is 20 and that's 21. So this is greater than 20 down here. So if you're going to read that, you're going to say, all right, that's 20. And if 21 is down here, there are 10 subdivisions. So what's this one? 20. This is 20.1 right here. This is a tenth of the, of the milliliter between these two. So if you go from here to here, that's one milliliter. But in between is a fraction of a milliliter. So this is a tenth of a milliliter, and this, this is two tenths of a milliliter. So we've got markings for those tenths. Those would be certain. So we would say that's 20. Point one and then something between one and point one and point two and you have to estimate the last digit so we're going to estimate that with that half so it's half of that position is here okay so you could subdivide this into 10 subdivisions which would be hundreds these are tens the estimate would be the hundreds so how do we interpret that number if you say that to any scientist who's properly trained they're going to know that these digits are certain. And this one is uncertain. It's a guess. And we write it that way so that they know where the certainty is. If you were to write this as 20.1 or 20.2, then they would assume that that position is uncertain. But if you have markings for those tenths, then you want to keep that information. It's like you just threw out this information. Okay. <clears throat> so I got an animation. There's the uncertain digit. Oh, and notice also, here we go. Where do you measure in a glass device, uh, a glass? Glassware in the lab, uh, if you have an aqueous solution in it, it's always going to form this curve. All glassware in the lab is calibrated for aqueous solutions to read the bottom of the meniscus. So you read it down here, you don't read it up there, you don't read it in between, you read it right on that line. That's the way it's been calibrated. So we also agree upon those types of things too. Some of them are, are not stated clearly. There are other agreed upon things that some people just don't know about. Okay, what's the difference between accuracy and precision? In the popular literature, these are used interchangeably. They will say uh, on news flash, um, something, something, something is precisely known. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. What do they mean? Well, they probably don't know what they mean, right? The talking heads are just given script and they read it. Accuracy is how close is your measurement to an agreed upon or a true value? It's, it's very difficult to know what the true value is for something. Sometimes you do, but most of the time, it's an agreed upon value, something that uh, a group has said, okay, this is going to be our center for that value. Uh, for instance, I used to participate uh, when I was in soils with um, working groups. And there would be soils labs for every state, 
this is particularly in the South, right? For Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, we'd all get together. And periodically, we would have standard samples of soils or plants sent to every lab. And we do our analysis and report our values. So the agreed upon value for that sample, if it was known in advance, then we could, we could compare our values to that. But if we didn't know, if this was a, a referee type sample that we were establishing an agreed upon value, then they would take all those measurements and compile them statistically and say, okay, this is the agreed upon value for that sample from now on. So that's comparison for your accuracy. Okay, and then we would just say, okay, um, we're accurate to within plus or minus so many units, whatever. Precision um, can be done without knowing what this is. Precision is grouping. You know, how close are your measurements to uh, each other? Okay. So, Here's what you would see if you had, uh, it's not accurate in this dart board, you're throwing darts at the board. It's not accurate and it's not precise, right? It's not accurate because the average of these is nowhere near the bullseye. It's not precise either because they're scattered all over the place. Um, anybody seen Young Frankenstein? It's a Mel Burks movie, okay? Remember the scene where the, the constable from the town throwing darts at the board with uh, Dr. Frankenstein, okay? And he was, <laughs> Frankenstein was trying to get him to miss the board. And eventually, found that all these darts were outside, stuck in, in the car's tires. That was definitely not accurate. Now, because they were close together on the tire, that may, maybe that was precise. <clears throat> this one is precise, but not accurate. Right? They're all close together, but they're nowhere near the bullseye. Right? So, got any shooters here or hunters before you go out into the field to hunt? You want to uh, true your scope. You want the scope to be looking at a given distance at where the bullet's going to land. So, you go out 100, 200 yards, however, whatever you're setting your scope to, and you set up your target. And you fire three shots in succession, right? Then you go look at it. It's good. If they all group together, then more than likely they won't be near the bullseye. But if they're precise, then that's that's the first step. Then you make adjustments to your scope. Right? And then you fire three more. And if you're lucky, they'll be grouped right here. So then you would have precision and accuracy from that rifle, and you're good to go. And you know. The true distance, right? If you if you treat your scope at 200 yards, then you know if the if the deer or your target is at 200 yards, then it will hit that point. If it's closer or farther away, then you have to make adjustments. This one is accurate and precise, right? That's what you want. Your multiple measurements agree with one another, plus they agree with any true value or agreed upon value that you may have. Sometimes you don't know accuracy at all. So you rely upon precision, right? Your measurements, if they're close together, then that's better evidence, not conclusive evidence, but better evidence that you're, that you may be accurate, but you just can't prove it. Uh, oh yeah, we are missing one other possibility. What is it? No. Why do I? Make it up. Okay. Okay. We have uh, not not precise, not accurate. Oh, accurate, not precise. Okay. Accurate but not precise would be like um, okay. We got a dart here. We got a dart here. We got one here. We got one here. So that's accurate but not precise because the average value of all of these is right there. Okay. Um, let me check my hard copy. So give me a, 
an idea of where I am. Okay. I'm gonna have to reprint this one. We should be good. Okay, so um, we need a way. Uh, whenever you make a measurement, it's inevitable that measurement is going to enter into some calculation. So when you when you start throwing math at, at your measurements, you got to know how to track their accuracy through the calculations. And the starting point is for each measurement that you make, you need to identify, characterize that in terms of which are the good numbers in that measurement, which ones are of value. And we call those significant figures. And we have rules, right? So this is your first rule. Significant figures. For individual numbers, how do you count the significant figures? Well, if your number is all non-zeros, then every digit in there is significant. So this example has four significant figures, three, four, five, six. There are no zeros in there. Then you have uh, numbers with zeros in them. And it just depends on other conditions as to whether those zeros count in with these significant figures. So the first class is zeros preceding the non-zero numbers. Okay. So the zeros uh, preceding a non-zero number do not count. That number only has two significant digits. So anytime you have zeros to the left, then if they're to the left, they'll invariably have a decimal in there somewhere. It wouldn't make any sense to write like that. That's, that's 48, right? You just assume that the decimal's right here, right? Those zeros don't mean anything. Their zeros are placeholders. So these placeholders don't count for that number because they're on the left-hand side. Okay. I'll, also, I'll draw your attention to this right here and that zero right there. If you write a number that starts with a decimal and trails off digits behind it, it's wrong. That's right. This is what I call, without that zero, it would be an orphan decimal. And orphan decimals are serious infractions. So pay attention when you're writing reports. <laughs> For me, anyway, don't do that. I always have that zero, that decimal bracketed. Uh, if it's over here, right, that's great. You know, that's no problem. But if it's out here dangling by itself, then it's wrong without that zero placeholder. Okay, what other types of uh, zeros do we have? Well, you have captive zeros. Any zero that's captivated by non-zero numbers is significant. The reason being, it's holding a place. It, I mean, it, if you don't have that zero there, then the, the number means something else. So that was significant. This number has four significant figures. So the one before, or, or which one, I mean, I just before, and the eight, the significant ones? Yes. Okay. Right. So so, even though we have to have those zeros, they're just not considered significant. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I have an explanation, sometimes I don't. <laughs> uh, this is agreed upon. I don't know if scientists did it or mathematicians did it. Uh, and then you have zeros to the right. Now, zeros to the right are only significant if there's a decimal involved. This one has a decimal, so those two zeros are significant. It would have a different meaning without those zeros, 9.3 rather than 9.300. This one has a zero to the right, but no decimals. That zero is not significant. Okay, how would we make that number? Three significant digits? Put a decimal. 
Now, the decimals on the right hand side, you don't have to put another zero. Uh, it should be obvious if you put another zero there, that means you've got another significant figure. It's like this. So that is not considered an orbital decimal. It's a, it's a dangler. Yeah, Forrest Gump, the tree. He was teaching Jenny how to dangle, right? So you have seen that book, right? Seen that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she taught me how to read and write, and I taught her how to dangle. Okay, or I showed her how to dangle. Okay, <clears throat> so those are the three conditions. Now we can use that information with another set of rules to track significant figures through a calculation. Okay. Oh, excuse me, I left out one more. These exact numbers. If you have an exact number, you can ignore significant figures when you're doing a calculation. It doesn't matter. They have infinite significant figures. So, and conversion factors are treated that way, right? One inch equals 2.54 centimeters. That's exact. When you use it in a calculation, you don't have to worry about it. It's got all the significant figures you need. Or counting numbers like nine pencils. That's an exact number. We generally don't think of uh, nine and a half pencils, even though you could have one, I guess, but that would mess up my explanation. So we don't talk about it. Okay. Uh, before we do calculations, we need to introduce another concept. Exponential notation. Now, the authors of your textbook don't make a distinction between exponential and scientific notation, but there is there is a, a serious difference between the two. Exponential notation just means you convert a standard notation number into a number that incorporates a power of ten. So this number right here is definitely ex exponential notation. This is called a coefficient. And this is the exponent. Okay, this number means exactly the same as that number. It's just, we've extracted the information here, moved the decimal place. Okay, we stored information, ones, tens. We stored that in, actually, excuse me, uh, we move it this way. So this is one tens, hundreds. We stored hundreds in this exponent. So that's why it's 10 squared. That's 100 times three would be 300. Okay. Um, exponential notation, this number can be anything. So let's, let me pick up just anything. Four, one, zero, three, four, something like that. So the decimal is understood to be here. If I want to make an exponential notation out of this, I can say uh, 410.34 times 10 squared. That's exponential notation. Scientific notation is a subset of that. Has to be right. The exponent has to be between one and 10. So this has to move over here until you get something like that. Four point one zero three four times what? One, two, three, four. Into the four. Okay, that's scientific notation. So all scientific notation is exponential notation, but not all exponential is scientific. Exactly right. Okay. Um, there are two advantages to using this system. One is obvious. You can express very large numbers, very small numbers, more compactly and preserve their information. Um, and also with this um, scientific notation, it's easy to determine what the significant figures are for that number, even if it's huge or very small. If you do your exponential, excuse me, scientific notation correctly, then this information is readily available. Okay. 
So um, there, there are two rules for calculations. So when you have two or more numbers that are multiplied or divided in an operation, that's one set of rules. If they're added or subtracted, that's another set of rules. And sometimes you get combinations. So you have to know which ones to do first, the order of operation. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So the first one is multiply divide. If you multiply or divide two numbers, the answer can have no more significant figures than the, the least number of significant figures in the operation. So this one has four, that one has two, the answer can only have two. That's the easier rule. So what you wanna do first is keep all your decimals. You know, your calculator is, is pretty stupid. It's gonna spit out a number that's like that. Then you have to decide how many of those digits can I keep. So here we, we kept these out of this operation, but we have to round it to two significant figures. And the rounding rules we're going to use are the simplest ones. You know, if it's five or above, you round up. If it's below five, you round down. But when you do the rounding, you say, all right, I need two significant figures. So I have a one, two. All right. I got a round on that number, and then I look to the right one. And that's the one that tells you whether to round up or down. You don't round this one to that one, and this one to that one, and that one to that one. You don't series them. You introduce massive errors when you do that. You only round based on the number to the, the digit to the right of the position that needs to round. Okay. Um, all right. Animation for you. Now add subtract. When you add subtract, you want to put your numbers in such a way that they line up their decimals. So this example has decimals in the numbers, which is fine for this example. But I'm going to modify that in just a second. And then you add everything up, right? In this case, you just add them up, carry your ones, add, 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 carry your ones. And then down here, you've got to decide how many of those can I keep. Well, you're limited to the least number of decimals in the operation. So right here like that, you're limited to that position. So if you're limited to this one, then you look to the right, it's five. So this will round up. And that's why 31.28 is your answer. Okay. Now, what if, what if you have a number like this? And like that, you add those together. Okay, one, three, 11, four. Now, where do you round? You look, right, you look to the significant figures. There's no decimal here, so that was not significant. So that means you have to round there to this position. Four, one, three, with the placeholder. Because if you don't put that place over in there, that's 413, not 4130. That's not in the textbook, so I figured I better make mention that. Now, of course, if it has decimal here, you round to that one because it's significant. So that's the point that there, the rule says align the decimals, which you do, right? The, Assumed decimal place is right here. So we align those decimals. But for significant figures, there's no decimal there. So it's not significant in that position. All right. So let's see if we can make some more progress here. All right. So with that thought in mind, when you add two real measurements together, the accuracy of your measurement is dependent upon the least accurate instrument in a series. In this example, we're measuring, uh, it looks like three milliliters here out of that one. We're combining it with 0.3 milliliters here. Put those together. So what can you claim about the accuracy of this measurement? You're limited to this one. 
So let's see, did I do? Yeah, okay. So we're saying this one is 3.0 because it lands right on the line. That's the uncertain number right there, right? It's zero. Okay, so we're saying this number has two significant figures. This one is uh, it's a different scale. They make them look the same, but the, yeah, I know that that's kind of dumb. Now I'll make this one narrower to be better. This one is estimated at 0.3 for that line. But if it's right on the line, you're saying, okay, it's 0 0.30. You're estimating the last digit. That's the uncertain one. And then when you put them together, you can only claim 3.3 milliliters as the combined volume. You can't claim this extra hundreds there in your answer. Okay. All right, so problem solving. Um, this is the way the authors word it. What's my goal? What do I do? How do I get there? I like it better. What's my goal is when you, when you read the question or you're investigating a problem, you want to say, what's the question? What is the problem? Right? If you don't know what the question is, you don't know what the problem is, you're never going to get the answer. So that's your first step. What, what's the question? And that's one of the, the tricks that test makers use. They, the, especially word problems. Word problems are specifically divine, devised to confuse the test taker. Unless you know that material, you're confident in your knowledge, then you can read the question and you won't be confused by how it's presented. Okay. That's why multiple choice questions can be uh, truth telling. <clears throat> anyway, so what's the question? And then you ask yourself, um, what do I need to answer that question? Do I have the information I need? Right? Sometimes all of it is given in the problem. Sometimes you have to go digging for it. You have to go look for it, like in the useful information table. You need that information. And then you devise a, a scheme. How do I get there? How do I use that information to get the answer? Some problems are simple, one-step answers, right? Those are the ones on my test that are like one, two, three points max. And then uh, some of them are more complicated. Those are like more than 10. 15 points because you have to multiple steps. Sometimes the problem needs to be simplified or break it into steps. I need to answer this question and then I need to answer that question and I take that, those answers, then I can answer this question. That's the way you handle complicated problems. You break them into manageable pieces. It's kind of like cooking. Well, chemistry is like cooking, only you can't make a spoon. <clears throat> okay. So now dimensional analysis, unit conversions is really what that means. Oops, I do that a lot, but accidentally push the button. Um, to convert one unit to another, you need a conversion factor. You need to know what's the relationship between this unit of measurement and that unit. So in order to, to know that, you need an equivalence. Uh, we looked at that equivalence early, earlier, like um, uh, one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. There's your conversion factor. Now, how does the conversion factor work? Conversion factors work because all conversion factors are equal to one. So if I have uh, 10 inches and I want to convert it to centimeters, I need something that will cancel that inches and make centimeters. And so how do I get that? Well, there's your starting point. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters. In mathematics, if you divide 
both sides of an equation by the same number, and in our case, the same unit, then you haven't changed it. If you do the same thing to both sides, that's a legitimate mathematical uh, procedure. So we need to convert this one to centimeters. That means we need centimeters over here on top, and we need inches on the bottom. So let's divide both sides through by one inch. Like that. I haven't changed that equivalence. It's still equivalent. But what is this? That's one. And one is equal to this. So I can multiply this by one. Right? That's valid. I can multiply it by one. It doesn't get me the answer I want. So I have to substitute. I have to substitute something else in there besides one. Well, I know what's equivalent to one. This right here, 2.54 centimeters, one inch. Now, this is in the denominator. That's in the numerator. Anytime you see a, a, a number sitting by itself and, and no fractional indication, it's always numerator, right? It's understood to be like that. So this inch cancels that inch. And that brings out another point. Whenever you're doing calculations in the sciences, units behave like numbers. Multiply units together, divide units together, add, subtract units, just like numbers. So if they cancel, fine. If they don't, you have to keep them. In this case, they cancel. So we're left with centimeters. And now all you have to do is multiply the number. Like number crunch. You deal with the units first, then you crunch the number. So 10 times 2.54 is 25.4 centimeters. So we know that 10 inches is 25.4 centimeters. And we also know that uh, why conversion factors work, because they're all equal to one. So if we needed to convert inches to something else, then we needed to convert it to, uh, I don't know, kilometers. You could say, okay, well, I got centimeters. But I want to make kilometers. So I can get I can get centimeters canceled here and make meters. How many centimeters in a meter? Well, a centi is a tenth, so that means you need a uh, hundred, excuse me. So you need a hundred centimeters in one meter. And then but that didn't give me the kilometers. So I need to cancel meters too to make kilometers. So one kilometer is a thousand meters. Uh, there you go. So we cancel meters, we cancel centimeters, and just crunch the numbers, and it'll tell you kilometers. That's called a chained conversion. And it's valid because every one of these factors is equal to one. So we just said multiply that by one, one, one. Only we substituted something in there that's equal to one. And that's the conversion factor. Okay. That's kind of hard to see. I, I should have done it all over here. You're going to see it enough. You're going to see it over and over again. Conversion factors are here to stay for the rest of the semester. Let's get this out of the way in case the next slide needs that space. All right. So this is the author's example of conversion. You know, we can take it or leave it. That conversion factor, since it's one, if you invert it, it's still equal to one, isn't it? Okay. So if you need uh, the unit, it's on the bottom here, but you need it on the top, all you can do is flip it. It's still equal to one. And you can use it that way. Okay. Let's see. We're not going to spend a lot of time in here because you're going to get plenty of practice doing it. Here's a chain conversion. Uh, another example I like to use is uh, when we start analyzing problems uh, logically to arrive at an answer, I use the, the example of how much is it going to cost me to drive from here to Atlanta? I've got family in Atlanta, so I do that calculation. But you need to know how far it is. You need to know the uh, efficiency of your engine, miles per gallon, and you need to know how far it is. 
And you can use those factors to convert the miles that I'm going to drive to how much it's going to cost. And that's dimensional analysis. Oh, I did here one here for New York to Los Angeles. Right. So we probably shouldn't take time to do it right now. We're running short. Um, okay, I think the last discussion part here is temperature. And temperature incorporates some unit conversions. Uh, so there are three main temperature measurement systems. There, there are actually more than that, but these are the only ones that we're going to be dealing with. It's Fahrenheit, of course. Fahrenheit is still used in the US. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, weather is reported worldwide in Fahrenheit. I know it is in this country. No. So Elsewhere it's Celsius. Okay. There's like one other country that uses Fahrenheit. Okay. It's Kelvin in the US. Okay. Um, so we're familiar with Fahrenheit, right? We know the water freezes at 32 degrees and boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but remember, nature just does what it does. That boiling point uh, is, it happens. No matter what the temperature measurement is, it still happens with, at that point of input of energy, it will happen. The system that we use to measurement will change. The system in one unit of years, 212 degrees, and Celsius, 100 degrees Celsius. And uh, Kelvin is uh, 373.15. Kelvin. You don't say degrees for Kelvin, you say Kelvin. Uh, so the same phenomenon is happening at all those different measurements. So that means that they're convertible. Right? If I say, uh, water boils at 100 here, and it boils at 212 here, then there's a relationship between those two that we can use to convert them. Right. So this is what it would look like for uh, water boiling here. Excuse me, wait a minute, did I say? Oh, they're using 37 degrees. Let's see. 37 degrees Celsius is body temperature. 98.6. <clears throat> and those are your three scales. I don't know if I have time to explain how they came about. Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit came first, and it was uh, devised by uh, the person's name was Fahrenheit. It was devised for biological sciences in particular. So he wanted a system that was in a range that was typical for biological systems. So he said 100 degrees is probably hot enough. Most things are, are within 100 degrees and less. So I used 100 as its maximum. Um, and his coldest temperature was um, ice and salt, as cold as he could get. So that was a zero point. And 100 degrees was what he considered to be normal. Uh, body temperature. I, I had a physics professor in high school who used to say Fahrenheit built his thermometer and his wife was pitching a fit at him for something one day and he stuck it in her mouth and that was 100 degrees. <laughs> I know it's not true. <clears throat> Celsius was more chemically oriented. He wanted something that was easy to measure and reproduce anywhere. So he said, all right, Zero for me is going to be the freezing point of pure water. Easy to manufacture, easy to determine. And 100 degrees is going to be the boiling point of water, pure water, at one atmosphere pressure. So you could standardize your thermometer very easily. For, for chemists, that was perfect. Kelvin came along, Lord Kelvin. Uh, recognized that in calculations, especially for, for the gas laws, because they came first, they came before anything else. Uh, gas law investigations were first. 
uh, and for various reasons that I'll explain in, in the future. Um, Kelvin said, we need a system that has only positive numbers, right? Because when you start doing calculations, if you got negative numbers, that just messes everything up. But nothing works. So he looked at, you know, how do we get uh, a positive scale? Well, they're working with gases. So he said, we know that if the temperature is here and this is volume, we know that most gases, the ideal gas, in fact, is what they used, would be like that. And those, as the temperature increased, the volume increased. We'll talk about that later, it's Charles Law. But it's only within these, these ranges of temperatures. He said, all right, what would happen if I extended? If I extrapolate that one. So he did. I actually, it was more complicated than that. Uh, Kelvin's system was based upon thermodynamics. And I've got the paper in somewhere in my office that describes how we logically book. This is a simpler explanation that makes more sense. So that's why I'm talking this way. So he said, all right, we're going to extend that line. At what temperature does an ideal gas? Become zero volume because an ideal gas is, is assumed to have no volume of so there, there are points. Yeah, absolute zero was his explanation. So this on the Kelvin scale is zero, but you can compare it with uh, Celsius, right? Because this was Celsius in the beginning. So if this is uh, zero degrees Celsius. Then what's this one? This is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So if you start measuring your temperatures, temperatures at absolute zero, there's nowhere to go but up. You can't go lower than absolute zero. In fact, we never got to absolute zero. I mean, some chemists have claimed that they've gotten there, but they only do it one molecule at a time. And they use lasers. Absolute. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of all the molecules in a substance. So if you stop their kinetic energy, and they use gases. So if you fire a laser at a gas molecule with just enough energy, you know it's coming this way, and you stop it, then it's an absolute zero. That's technicality. But we really can't bring large volumes or masses of substance to absolute zero. Because think about it. How does a refrigerator work or an air conditioner? It dumps heat from, from the, the source to the sink. So if you're going to cool your house, you take that heat and you put it outside. Well, if you try to cool something to absolute zero, what's colder than that? Where are you going to dump your heat? You can't. So you're never going to get to absolute zero. We've come really close. About 4K, yeah, yeah. And that's due to background microwave radiation from, they, they say, from the Big Bang. Anyway, so that's where Kelvin came from. And anytime you do uh, calculations, well, most of the time you do calculations in chemistry, you use Kelvin. There are a couple of instances where you can use Celsius, but they're specialized, and we'll talk about those. And yeah, yeah, I believe it's, I believe it's this semester. Colligative properties. No, no, it's second semester, excuse me. Sorry. You'll have to come back for that. <laughs> uh, okay, so conversions. Well, uh, Celsius to Kelvin is easy because the size of the, the unit is the same for both of them. So all you have to do is just shift the zero point. So if you want to know Kelvin, you just add 273. And I generally do just 273. For our purposes, that's good enough. 273 plus Celsius gives you Kelvin. Or if you got Kelvin, you subtract that from it, you get Celsius. That's the easy one. The one that's a little more complicated is going between Celsius and Fahrenheit because they don't have the same 
they don't have the same size degree mark. Right? The Fahrenheit degree mark is smaller than the Celsius. So you have to make an adjustment for the size of the degree mark, plus you got to shift the zero point. So that's why um, for this calculation, if you want to know Fahrenheit, then you've got to add 32 degrees to this calculation to give you Fahrenheit. This adjusts for the size of the degree mark, nine-fifths or 1.8. You see it that way too. 1.8 times C plus 32 is Fahrenheit. That's the way I memorized it. So if you know this one, you can do that one, right? Algebra, you should rearrange your variables, solve this one for that one, or plug the values in and then solve it for the unknown. Uh, that's another constant in chemistry, math, physics, whatever. If you have a, an equation, and it has several variables in it, but you have values for all those variables except for one, and you can solve it. One equation in one unknown is solvable. Um, it's only when you get two and an equation in two unknowns that you need two equations. So if you've had algebra, you understand where I'm coming from. And there are methods to do that, but we're not going to do that. In this class, you're going to know all but one of the unknowns if you need to solve an equation. Okay, so at what temperature, this is an interesting problem, at what temperature is the unit, the, not the unit, but the, the uh, magnitude, the value of Celsius equal to the value of Fahrenheit? Because if you put them on a, on a chart, they have different slopes. So someplace they're going to intersect, right? So how do we do that? Well, here's our equation. If this temperature is equal to that temperature, just set your variables the same, right? This is x and that's x, right? They're the same, aren't they? X is the same. So if you make x here and x there, then you solve for x. And if you solve for x, just minus 40 degrees Celsius is equal to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And I know what that temperature feels like. I used to work in a hotel, restaurant, and institution supply house. You know, we'd supply them with dry goods, canned, canned goods. We'd supply them with meats or cured products. Uh, we, would, uh, we would bring in the uh, uh, chuck on big refrigerated trucks and grind it ourselves and make hamburger patties for restaurants. And then we'd freeze them. We blast freeze it. So we had, a, we had a cooler section. And then you go through the cooler section and you go to this freezer that was set at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And we would store things in there. We'd, we'd roll things in and freeze them, but sometimes we'd store some things in there. Well, I was a new kid on the block. I was going to college and I was hired off the street. So uh, I was a low man on the totem pole, so every month we'd have to do inventory. And the blast freezer was my responsibility. <laughs> so I'd suit up in a, in a quilted, insulated coat, went to the floor, had a nice insulated cap, big gloves on, and I'd, I'd have an extra large pencil so I could hold it and, and do my inventory. And I'd be in there for maybe 15 minutes. I'd come out into the cooler, which was a lot warmer. And, and do that and then go back in, do it again until I finally got all the information. Uh, the incentive though, once a month, they would go back to our stock and they'd get things like bacon and sausage from our storage. Uh, and then they had to buy eggs. I think we had kept eggs. Oh, okay. You can sit in. As soon as I'm finished with this, we'll talk about the lab. Yeah. I forgot that. Yeah, have a seat. <laughs> have a seat. Uh, okay. So we're just about finished with this. Uh, where was I? Oh, the incentive. Um, 
one of the old timers there that, that could really cook would take all that nice good stuff and he'd uh, make biscuits on the side and, and everything and we'd come in early to work and he'd have this big high calorie breakfast waiting for us so we'd just chow down and then we could burn off all those calories in the cold freezer <clears throat> okay so we're going to use this as an example for uh, a formula and solutions to formulas Right. If you've got this relationship, density is mass divided by volume. Right. So what you need to know is what are the units of measure? Well, density is usually, mass is usually in grams, and volume is cubic centimeters for solids. Liquids, we generally say milliliters. So a liter is the fundamental unit. The milliliter is a thousand of a liter. So it takes a thousand milliliters to make a liter. The, the, the neat thing about this is the size of the measure, one of those is exactly equal to one of those. So the hospital situ, uh, setting, they, everything used to be measured in cc's. Sometimes you'll still see that. cc's, cubic centimeters. They use that because um, it was easier to print CC than it was centimeters with a cube. And most people didn't understand what milliliter was anyway, so they didn't use that. Now they do. They use, they use the metric system uh, without fail. So density is a calculation using mass and volume. So uh, mass and volume are what I call capacity factors. In other words, it does matter how much of the substance you have as to what size this is. Right? If you have more, more of the substance, you got more mass. If you got more of the substance, you got more volume. Those are capacity factors. Density is an intensity factor. Or your textbook might call it intensive property. And this would be an extensive property. The intensive property is one where the amount of substance doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much gold you have in your pocket. It's still going to be a given density. Uh, I should have thought about that before I said it. But silver, I'll just use silver. I know what that one is. Silver is 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter. So if you have a pocket full of coins, or if you have uh, just one coin, it's going to be the same density. Always, that's an intensive factor. It doesn't matter how much you have, but it does matter here. You have a different mass of coins in your pocket. You have a different volume of coins. But this formula, uh, abbreviated like this, is just that. You have three variables. Density, mass, volume. If you know two of them, you can solve for the third. So if you're given a problem that says uh, the density is this, and you have volume of that, how much mass do you have? Plug in the value, plug in the value, solve for the unknown. It's that simple. And you can you can rearrange it if you want beforehand, but it's just algebra. Very simple algebra, actually. If you had an algebra course and passed it. Um, any of the algebra we use in chemistry is going to be child's play. But it's fundamental. Okay. Useful. Here we go. Um, so this is an example. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It just illustrates that you can calculate the density if you know these values, or um, if you know the density and the volume, you can cal calculate the mass. And then you use your rules for significant figures in a calculation to determine how many significant figures you can keep in your answer. Right? This is multiply or divide rules. If you have a combination of rules, then you need to know what's the order of operation. Well, if you've got parentheses in your calculations, that's good. Because remember, everything inside the parentheses you do first. 
If you don't have parentheses, then you have to fall back on what? And I remember that one. Uh, parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, subtract. You do them in that order. If you're not told by the, the calculation which to do first. Okay. I thought I was getting close to the end. Almost. When we talk about matter, we're going to stick to liquids, solids, and gases. Solids, liquids, and gases. There are other forms of matter, and these are physical forms. So you can have a compound or a substance that has an identity, and it can be solid, and you can make it into a liquid to add enough energy to melt it, or add enough energy to turn it into a gas if it's stable enough. And these are physical changes. Like you're not changing the identity of the substance. Um, but characteristics of them are subjectively uh, gases, in this case steam, the molecules are very far apart. And most gases, uh, if they're going to behave ideally, you can treat the volume of the individual molecules as if it doesn't exist. That's why Kelvin said, okay, I'm going to take this all the way down to zero volume. For an ideal gas, you can do that because the molecules are considered to be point volume. Remember in math or geometry, a point has no volume. It has no length, breadth, or width at all. That's a point. Uh, if you have a, a, a line, that's got one dimension, you know, just length. If you have a like a square or a rectangle, that's two dimensions, this way and that way. Or if you have a cube, you can go this way, that way, that way. But these uh, water molecules are considered to have no volume at all. But when they get close enough, they do start to interact. And you have space in here, but there's not enough attraction between the molecules to keep them uh, rigid in place. So that's why water or all liquids cannot maintain their own shape. They have a definite volume for mo in most cases, but they don't have a definite shape. Whereas solids, they're locked in place for their shape and their volume. Okay, characteristics, we've already talked about that. I'm not going to labor that for <clears throat> I will talk about mixtures. When you take uh, two or more substances and put them together, blend them together, you have two possibilities. You can either have a homogeneous mixture. So you put everything in there and mix it up. And wherever you sample it, you get the same composition, the same percentage of each of your components. It's a physical mix. There's no chemical reaction here. This, this mixing, uh, if it's homogeneous, will be uniform throughout composition. So if you have 10% sodium chloride over here in this salt water, you'll have 10% over here. That's homogeneous. Heterogeneous, wherever you sample it, you get a different composition. So if you mix up, uh, for my uh, purposes, if you take a soil sample and put it in water, mix it up, maybe put a little sodium hexaphosphate in it as a uh, keep it from sticking together. We use that to determine uh, particle size. But if you mix it in there, if, if you wait, it will settle. So that means that mixture has an uneven distribution. It's heterogeneous. Okay. And even soils in the ground are heterogeneous. Right. And when you sample soils, uh, if you know a farmer, if you sample soils to send off to the lab for, to determine fertility, um, the recommendation is you take samples from multiple spots in your field right? because they're heterogeneous. Soils are by nature heterogeneous. 
So you take multiple samples and mix them together. Okay, homogeneous mixture, we're just gonna say gasoline is the only one here. Rest of them are either heterogeneous mixtures or they're not mixtures at all. So when you're answering this question, you look at what's the question? First of all, is it a mixture? Well, pure water is not a mixture. It's a compound. Uh, copper metal is not a mixture. So you throw those out. Right? And then you look for this part, homogeneous. Which one's homogeneous? Well, soil, I just toasted it out for one. And uh, jelly beans in a jar, they're not homogeneous. So gasoline's the only one that works there. Uh, okay, the difference between physical changes and chemical changes. It's all based upon the identity of the substances. If the identity changes, then there has been a chemical change. So for instance, um, let's see. Oh, our first example, when we elect electrolyzed water, water was a liquid. We electrolyzed it and we made two gases, oxygen and hydrogen. That's a chemical change. Uh, if we freeze water, then you can thaw it out and you still got liquid water. So the physical change did not change the identity of the water. That's a physical change. And physical changes uh, allow us to separate mixtures based upon their physical properties. So distillation is one where we, we boil the mixture and some of it comes off at one temperature and some of it comes off at another temperature and some of them come up at all because the temperature is not high enough. And you can distill, separate, or you can filter, or you can use this process called chromatography, which we don't have time to discuss right now. But a chemical change will give you a new substance. You change the identity of the product. And your Bunsen burner. Uh, natural gas into your burner and you light it, right? Comes in as a gas, methane, and it goes out as carbon dioxide and water. Right? You changed its identity. Uh, okay, I'm not going to spend time on these. This is uh, out of your book, right? So you can subdivide things. Matter can either be mixtures or pure substances. So water is a pure substance, copper is a pure substance, but that example. Copper is an element. Uh, water is a compound, but they're pure substances. Uh, or you can have mixtures. And if you want to change it with a pure substance, if it's a compound, you can change it into elements. But to do that, it has to be a chemical change. If you want to separate things that are mixtures, then you can do that with by physical means. Okay. So for the lab. We've got a, see, is this the right one? Yep. We've got a syllabus for the lab, too. We're not going to repeat the stuff that we've already gone over because a lot of it is repetition from the lecture. Um, you are going to need a calculator, of course. There are no textbooks. There are no lab manuals to supply. But you will need one of these. Oh, I, I told you. I went to Walmart and seen that they were on the shelf and bought two of them. Because I had these one of two and yeah. this one. You have to get them, and then they won't get them back yet. Because they're sold out. But yeah. they're still a week. Yeah. They said they had them elsewhere. Yes. Not at this one that looks first. I have another student in uh, 101, 101, 103 at uh, Beckley. She found them at Kroger. Oh, wow. Well, and they're, they're cheaper. cheaper. Because nobody was looking there. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and check out Kroger. <laughs> and, and she said they were like 55 or 56 cents. Still a buck. Now, I've got some in my van. You know, if you want to buy one off me, I'll sell you one. But I have to charge you a buck because that's what I pay for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me know at the end of class if you need one, then I'll run down here. Um, okay, so you will need that notebook. And it needs to be this uh, quadral line. It needs to be look like graph paper. Okay. <clears throat> You're going to need a lab coat. Need like, like this one. Where do you get those? I think you have. Most of my students order them online. Okay. 
I think we have some uh, disposable somewhere that you can use temporarily. Uh, yeah, here they are. These yellow things. So when when we actually have to go in to do a wet lab, then you can use one of those. But in the meantime, order one to, to back up. I've had this one for years. Probably looks at you. Um, eye protection. Um, I think we've got some eye protection around here, but I wouldn't guarantee it. Probably always get something like that too. Um, goggles are good or uh, over glasses that have side protection. You get those, they're pretty cheap. You can find those around. I think the same same lady found the uh, found them at Walmart. Yeah, Kroger. <laughs> I think she went to Walmart for those. <laughs> um, because they have um, uh, hardware. Any place you have hardware, they're going to have safety devices. Uh, eye protection uh, gloves, we provide those uh, disposable gloves. Okay, so we'll talk about the lab notebook in just a minute. In fact, you know what? Is anybody going to want one from me? Want one? Well, since I need to talk about them and I didn't bring one with me, let me go down in my hand just just to get one. Because it's easier to show and tell when I have something to show. So I'll be right back. <laughs> Staying home from COVID. Yes. I'm out of shape. Okay, this works. There you go. You don't have change. You bring to the next week. I've got a hundred dollars. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the price just went up. Okay. Okay. So, what do we do with these things? Well, if you look at the Syllabus, you'll see. It is. <clears throat> you'll see uh, in the schedule, we have scheduled labs. Let's see, got us one up here. We have seven labs scheduled. Let's notice that. Seven exams, seven labs. And the first two labs are going to. Uh, require informal reports. That just means take hard copy and um, you fill that. You just answer it on the hard copy. So this is the first one where you do that. It was introducing graphing techniques. It's got that on the pages in the back when you, you start answering questions, it's got assigned points. So I know how many points to charge for each one. That's an informal report. <laughs> You spell out. And uh, in this case, you'll have to also draw some graphs. So there's graph paper in there also. Um, the second one is also an informal report on lab techniques where we, we just get comfortable with various pieces of equipment. But by the third one, uh, let's see, waters of constitution and hydration, you're going to be generating a formal report. And there's a, a, there's a format. That, that follows. And I, I got examples for you, so don't get panicked. If you've never written a formal report, the first time you do it is going to be probably uh, nerve wracking. But um, I want to show you how to make it easy on yourself. Um, so we don't need to talk about the informal reports because they're just, you know, just busy work, you know, doing what the question asks. And, Filling in the answers. And sometimes the answers require that you uh, extract data from the experiment and to put it in there. Um, so, with the formal report, we start with the, the uh, uh, notebook. So, the first time I check your notebook, and I'll, I'll do that, I'll always bring your notebook to class, and I'll, I'll do a preliminary check the first time you come to class with it. So, what you need is your name. 
the course that you're in and the semester and any other information you want is fine but those three things you absolutely have to have on this, on this book and you open it up and the next thing you do is number every page remember those days <laughs> number every page in ink right? everything's in ink no pencils in this thing and try to use black or blue unless you have a special reason for using a different color just don't use red that, that's my color it's reserved uh so you start numbering in the upper right hand corner here is number one so that means when you open this over here to that side that's number two so that means that all the right facing pages are odd numbered and all the left facing pages are even you just number all the way to the end. I think it's what, 200 of them. I believe it's exactly 200. So if you're if you're going along and you say, and you start to put a even number at the top of this page, stop. Probably skip one back here somewhere. Go back, make your correction. How do you make a correction in a lab notebook? Draw a line through it. Write the truth. Write what you want. You don't try to erase, you don't white out, none of that stuff. That's bad laboratory practice. <clears throat> I mean, even if you have a whole section that you say that's wrong, you just a big X through it and then go to the next page. Oh, by the way, uh, we've got all this. I'm going to get ahead of myself if I can keep it up. Uh, once you've got it, uh, numbered pages, then you go back to the first page and the title here is Table of Contents. And then down below it, each time we do an experiment, you write in the name of the experiment and the page it starts. That's all it needs, just the page it starts. I'm sorry? Algebra? Okay, well, good. She made us have a good book for all the content we did. Okay. It was a binder and she gave us a book for now, table of contents, and we had it added a new topic every time. Okay. Took them and them. Make sure you taking notes. I don't know how she read my handwriting. Yeah, you may want to write legibly enough so you can at least read your own handwriting. But consider this: if you work for a company, or you work for the government, like I did, uh, you if you do any lab work, you have to have a lab notebook and permanently bound lab notebook. In fact, the federal government has these ugly green things. You know, you can't use anything else but those. But at least they provide you enough. And uh, everything you put in that notebook belongs to your employer. and belong to you. So when you leave that employment, if ever, or you retire, that stuff stays behind. So that there's continuity from your work to anybody who follows you. And if you are considerate, in the lab and you want to be nice to anybody that follows you you write it in such a way that they can understand what you're writing and duplicate your experiment if necessary uh, or for yourself if you have to go back and repeat an experiment you want to be able to use this and go back and do the exact same thing so there needs to be enough detail in here to do that and i'm going to show you how to build that detail in so once you got your table of contents um, you don't have to skip to the next page, maybe over to page five. And then the title, right? what's the experiment we're going to do? And then a series of topics in here that I think I put in, in here. Let's see if we back here. Yeah. Okay. So on page three of the syllabus, you'll see at the bottom, Exercise title. That's the title of the exercise that we're going to do. And you have an introductory statement, or you could call it um, uh, purpose, or you could whatever. But it's it's a general statement as to what's expected to happen in the experiment. It may even have a, a hypothesis involved. You know, what do you think is going to happen? Then you have a little section on safety. You know, what are the safety concerns for this lab? I mean, do you need to wear a uh, a hazmat suit? No, not in these labs, but that's an example. 
then what materials are you going to be? Right? And I've got an example. I'll put it up on the, on the screen here in a minute. What materials are you going to need? Then what is the procedure? Step-by-step -step procedure from the printed document. This is what you want to do. You want to put it in enough detail so that you know what to do step-by-step. -step. It's like a recipe. Um, then you set aside a section in your notebook. And by the way, you're only going to put this in the right-hand side, only on odd pages. Leave the even pages alone. That's for expansion if necessary, right? If you, if you have a big section that's wrong, you can't, and you've got all this information behind it, you can't just cross it out and put it in the cracks. You cross that out, and then you put the correction over on that blank page. Or maybe you need to draw a graph, and there's none of them here. You draw the graph on that page over there. So that's kind of like overflow. So always leave the, odd, the even pages alone. And when you're writing on the, the uh, odd pages, double space. Because if you have minor corrections, then you've got a place to put them. You just cross through this one and then write what you wanted underneath. Uh, procedures, data. Set aside a section for your data and observations. Data is like numbers. Values, uh, measurements that are made. And then you have a section on calculations. You know, if you have to derive some values from your measurements, then the calculations is where you show how you did it. So just set aside a section for that. Um, many of these exercises have pre-lab questions. And those have to be put in here in your notebook and answered before you come in the lab. That's kind of get you Get your steam up for the lab let to so you know what you're going to be doing you have a, uh, an idea uh, some of these pre-lab questions uh the calculations involved are the same type of calculations you're going to be doing when you get your own data so they're good practice but those have to be answered before you come in the lab in your notebook and then you may have post lab questions so you set aside a section for the post lab questions and you can write the questions in ahead of time if you want and leave a space to answer. Um, but those you can answer after. And then you have a discussion section. So this is where you critically evaluate what happened in the lab and draw conclusions, even summarize, summarize what was done in the lab and then draw your conclusions and do some thinking. This is the thinking part of the lab when you discuss it, when you draw conclusions. Now, with all of that information, once you've completed the lab and all that information is in there, calculations are done, it's all completed, you're ready to go to the next one. You will have enough information in your lab notebook that you can write a formal report because the formal report follows that structure. Okay, so then all you need is typing skills. So if you touch type, great. If you're a hunting pecker, well, maybe you're good enough to go faster with two fingers. I don't I hear my son in there, he's a hunting pecker and he's just flying through the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how you set up your notebook and prepare for writing a formal report. Um, so before we go to those uh, visuals, let's cover a couple more things again. Um, it takes time and effort to set up a lab. I've got to bring the materials out. Sometimes I have to prepare solutions and so forth and make sure all the equipment is here that you're going to need. So makeup labs are difficult, if not impossible, especially since I'm only here one day a week. So try not to miss if you can help it. I mean, if something, if life happens and you can't make it, then we'll have to make some type of arrangement because I don't want you to miss the experience of the lab. It helps uh, solidify what you learned in the lecture. All right, grading scale 70% for the lab reports, just like the exams, 70%. A 
lab skills, which is kind of a, it's sort of subjective on my part. Um, just don't have any stupid accidents. Right? Accidents happen, right? So we want to minimize those efforts and participate. Right? You, you have a lab partner and you're conducting an experiment. Um, don't let your partner do all the work. You know, divide up the labor. I'm not sure how we're supposed to do that with social distancing. Maybe one partner's on one side of the bench and the other's on the other side of the bench. And then your lab notebook, the grades that I, I assign to your lab notebook are worth 15%. So I'll, I'll look at it at least twice. So I want to see in the beginning, do you have it set up right? Because I don't want you to, to go the whole semester with your notebook out of whack. You know, we want to catch some major errors in the beginning and then see that you're following through. And then maybe in, in the mid or later part of the semester, I'll do another check. Uh, and I'll be looking for other things then, just to see if you're putting everything in, in the methods and your the exercises that you're gonna need. Now, if you're missing information, uh, if it's eligible, I may dock you for that. Um, but it doesn't have to be pristine. I know some students prefer to uh, write things down on scraps of paper or on a loose leaf notebook and then put them in their lab notebook later. Everything that happens in the lab, and, and that, in fact, this is the only thing you bring into the lab for the formal reports. And you do the experiment from your lab notebook. So you set it up in here and then you leave that hard copy in your bag, work it from here. And then as you go through the experiment, this is where you put your information. It doesn't have to be pretty. Try to make it legible. But if you make a mistake, you just draw through it and write the correct. And when you, when you set up those uh, sections that don't have any information in them at first, try to set them up so that there are empty spaces for places that you know you're going to have information. Right? It's a good way to. That's a good way to do it because if you work your way down in an experiment and you say, okay, I'm putting in data down here, these things are blank. Why? Put on the brakes, stop. Why do we not have information up here? Did I miss a step? Well, if for some reason the lab changed, you know, if I'm evil and I, I changed some condition right as you walk in the door, then maybe this section doesn't have any data anymore. In that case, then you just put an X to it. But uh, if you have to set up that way, then you know if you missed something in your procedure. Uh, okay, uh, contact is the same. There's your, your list of, notice that uh, in this one, the yellow is the day that we do the experiment, not for an exam or when something's due. That's the difference between this one. If you want to know when it's due, just look over on the right. And in the red, it says something, something, something due. That tells you when it's due. And as a general rule, um, your report for a previous lab is due when we go into the lab to do the next exercise. Sometimes that's a week later. Sometimes it's two weeks later. Uh, so that's, that's why I set it up this way. So you've got two informal reports and five formal reports. And let's see. You want to be safe in the lab. What's the, the number one way to be safe in the lab? I'm sorry? Don't get stupid. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. Know what you're going to do before you walk in the lab. That's why I have you set it up here in the lab notebook because you have to you have to read through the lab. You have to consider safety when you're filling out your notebook. Um, preparedness is the number one way to prevent accidents. And then you can think about, you know, this particular experiment's got this going. It's got a hot burner over here. It's got acid over there. You know, and it's got these incompatible chemicals that I only put together in small amounts when it's time. I want to keep those separate for 
you know, so they don't spill over and react. I, we had a technician in the lab I worked at, um, accidentally, I guess, but uh, let's see, what was it? First of all, they weren't, you were not supposed to put a reagent back in a reservoir, in a, a supply bottle. Right? Once you draw it out, you have to dispose of it if you don't use it. But they put it back in the bottle and there was a reaction. It was in the wrong bottle. And there was a chemical reaction. The whole lab filled up with smoke. So we were, we had these uh, safety kits on the wall around the lab. And one of the things in that wall is like those, those big snakes, you know, with absorbent materials, pack the doors. Try to, try to keep that and shut off ventilation to that room. Or at least uh, so it doesn't spread to the rest of the lab. But that was a harrowing experience. Uh, okay, so let's see. I think that's all that I can say based on the syllabus. We'll go look at uh, Blackboard for a second. I'm running out of time. What you may have to do, we may get to talk about this lab a little bit and then complete it at home. You don't have one of these? I think you did. If you didn't, you have another copy. I make lots of copies. Okay, there you go. Have what? Oh, a syllabus? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Green work. That's I'm sorry. Um, no, let's dispense with that. But the syllabus agreement. Um, if you you're going to complete that uh, syllabus test for the lecture, and I'll let that go is, is sufficient. So once you do that one, then we're good to go. Uh, okay, so let me uh, let me put something up on the screen. Let's see. Uh, close this, and then we're going to go back in the blackboard, and we're going to look at forces. Forces. And yeah, let's see. No, we need to go down to the bottom of this case. One, two, seven, five, eight. Seven, five, eight. There we go. All right, so this needs start here. Yeah, it's picking it up. Uh, and here we go. So similar structure, there's a syllabus and there's a schedule. I was looking for, there's some things on safety. Lab exercises are here. So each one of the exercises has here we go. Like this exercise one, this, uh, you won't be doing this one. It's grayed out. Lab techniques, the next one we do. So if you want to look at it in advance before we come to class, uh, there's a copy of it. And actually, this is set up so that you could submit your reports online. So if you forget to bring them to class, uh, you just click on this thing right here, there. And that gives you access also to the document, plus a place to submit it here, attach files. And that's where you would submit before midnight on that day that it's due. Okay, so let me go back. And what else do you get in here? Let's see. Uh, don't worry about lab notebook pages. I'll, I'll try to get rid of those. That was for when uh, COVID was active. And I had to do everything online. So when I wanted a notebook grade for my students, they had to photograph or scan their notebooks and submit them here. But you're not going to have to do that because I'm going to see them. Um, also, here's a, uh, a demo. 
So when we were forced to stay home, I went into the lab periodically with permission of the president and produced, uh, did the experiment myself with a GoPro cam on my head. Well, actually, it was a knockoff. I can't afford a GoPro, they're too expensive. But it was a, a, a little camera and I, I recorded everything that I did in the lab. So they would view this video and then uh, write their report based upon it. Um, you probably would have access to it anyway because it's adaptive release. What they had to do was they had to turn in their lab notebook, show me it's prepared. And once I gave them a grade on that, the demo would open up. Right? But if you go in there now, you won't see it. What I may do is I'll just go in and remove all those adaptive releases so that you can see the demo. And that'll give you an idea of what's actually going to happen in the lab. Uh, okay, so let's see what else is there here. Nothing. So let's move on. I want to show you examples of reports. Let's see, are they down here? No, they must be up here. No, it's not there. Let's go back some more. Exercises notebook. Here we go. Okay. So we've got some instructions here. Uh, here's a copy of, in fact, I haven't updated this one yet. This is the rubric that I used to evaluate formal reports. This is from a previous semester, but it'll have the same components. In it. I just need to modify it a little bit so that when I grade your formal reports, I use one of these blanks, I, I scribble on it and give you a grade, and then I slap it with a report and hand it back to you. <clears throat> so you can see what you need to do for the Next one. Um, don't worry about the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, let's see. How about this one? Sample report. And this has got the rubric with it for this particular report. Okay, there it is. Okay, I'm going to need to rotate that if I can. Um, well, no. I know why I can't rotate it. Hold on a second. Do it this way. Same link as. That's not an HTML file. No, that's not going to work either. All right, we'll do our best. Let's go back. Okay, maybe I can shrink it. There. Just turn your head sideways a little bit. <laughs> so, what we've got is uh, you know how rubrics work. You have a let's see. You have these categories here. There's information that I'm looking for. And then across the other side, across here are the points. So if you do it this way um, for that category, you get 12 points. If you do it this way for that category, you get nine and on down till if you do it this way, you get zero. <clears throat> so that's how the rubric is structured. Uh, this student, I, I gave this student uh, 12 points for everything. It was almost perfect. And if you do that, then there are, I think, nine categories here. So nine times 12 is 108. So you can get more than 100 points, theoretically. Um, and let's see. Probably the, the place where students make the worst mistakes, let me. Let me expand this back up and then just scroll. Because I want to talk about the categories. There we go. This category, sections of the report. I'm looking for all of the sections that we put into your lab notebook. Those sections need to be in the report. Okay. If you're missing one, you lose points there. If you're missing two, if you're missing three, you get zero points. Three or more. Spelling and punctuation, that's where students lose the most points that are unnecessarily lost. Because word processors have uh, grammar and spell checkers. And you can save your neck with those. Plus you need to proofread it. Write your report, set it aside. 12 hours, 24 hours, come back and read it. Does it still make sense? 
Okay. So if you if you're uh, keeping up with things, you can do that. I mean, if you're a last minute person, then you won't have time to do that, and likely will make mistakes. Uh, grammar. This is one where my students lose a lot. Also, you'll notice that in the lab notebook and in the uh, hard copy, it says it's saying do this and do this and do this. In the report, the grammar needs to be third person passive past tense, which means what actually happened. And here's the way you would write it. For instance, if you um, if the method said uh, measure out measure 250 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution using a 500 milliliter graduated silver. Then when you write in your report, you would actually say what you did. And let's say for some reason I changed the method uh, a little bit on the spot. And instead of 250 milliliters, you need 260. So you would say 260 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide was measured using a 500 milliliter uh, graduated cylinder. Okay, that says what you actually did. And it's in third person. It doesn't say I or we, and it doesn't say you. That's first person or second person. Third person is it. And it, in this case, is 250 milliliters of sodium hydroxide was measured. That's third person passive past tense. Okay. And the report that goes with this does that very thing. It writes it in that in that format. Okay, so here's the title page. You got the title, you got your name, you got your partner's name. Okay. Um, this is a little more detail than you need. All you really need is the course and the semester. Right. You, this person said where it came from. This student did that experiment right here. And wrote the report. And then the date that the experiment happened. You can put the date that you wrote the report, that's fine, but I do need the date that the experiment happened. Okay, so here you have your objectives, right? It's like that uh, beginning statement purpose. These are your objectives. Then you have materials, then you have a blurb on safety, then you have procedures. The procedures need to be in third person passive past tense. There were some typos, right? some errors, but I didn't count heavily for those. Let's see. Uh, there's more. And then the data. This data is perfect. This is publishable, publishable format. You could put this in a referee journal. More. <laughs> this actually has calculations, I believe. Yeah. Pressure times volume is this one right here. And, and probably this uh, needed to be blended with that first table. Because notice we really don't know where this, these numbers came from. So I missed that one. But I didn't count off the student's uh, paper. That was my mistake. I should have caught it but they didn't get penalized. And of course, students already passed my course, so I can't do anything about it. <laughs> and then the graphs. Graphs may not always be necessary. You may not need the graphs graph every time. But if you do, then in the case of graphs, if you don't feel proficient at using Excel or some other graphing program, you can do it by hand. Just make it as legible as possible. And then uh, you would have to photograph or scan it to get it into your document. Because I don't, I don't want separate pages from different formats. When you submit your report, it's all in one form. It's either in PDF or Word 
or whatever processor you use. It needs to be a single document, not attached flyers all over the place. But in this case, the student felt comfortable with Excel and drew and put the graph in, in Excel and, and drew the, the uh, what do they call it? They call them charts in Excel, I think. So there's more. It was a second trial. Okay. And then calculations. There's a section on calculations that show how the calculations were done. And um, you don't have to do all of the calculations. You don't have to show me every calculation you did. Just show me, if you're going to do this type of calculation, show me how you did it for, for one of the uh, data sam samples. So that's what this student did. Just show me one calculation. That's good. I know you know what you're doing. And in the end, that's what I'm looking for. Do you know what you're doing and can you explain it to others? Uh, let's see. Questions. Those are pre-lab questions. Right? It's, the heading says pre-lab questions. I know where to go. The numbering system is the same that's in the, the document. So I don't have trouble finding. This student, I think, uh, actually wrote out the questions. Uh, you don't have to do that as long as I can follow where they came from. And if, if I can't remember, I can look at the document and say, oh, oh yeah, this, that question, right, this answers that question. Okay. Um, okay, so this student felt comfortable with Excel, but not with any drawing program. So <laughs> the student drew it by hand. And then uh, conclusions and summary. Right? So I can tell just by looking at it without even reading it first that there had to be some effort going into writing this. Then when I read it, I'll see if, if the thinking is clear. And then uh, the student must have uh, accessed some external source of information to probably to make comments here and cited the work. You don't have to cite it if you don't. You don't have to use citable works if you want to. But if you do, then of course you want to give the, the party that created it credit. Okay, so that's a, a formal report that's in pretty good shape. Let's see, what else was that going to show you? A notebook. Show you what a notebook looks like. Let's see, I don't need that one. Uh, let's see. Or let's see. Um, just a short word about plagiarism. I didn't make a copy of this, but you should, probably should read that. What is plagiarism in a lab report? Uh, if you're in a, a history course or an English course, it's pretty obvious what plagiarism is. So you just you quote somebody else and don't give them credit. In uh, generating a lab report, plagiarism most often surfaces as copying somebody else's work. So if you're in lab with somebody, say you're partnering with uh, someone um, and you collaborate in such a way that one of you basically writes the report and the other one just copies it, puts their name on it. Uh, that's definitely plagiarism. And I've had that happen. <clears throat> with <coughs> cohabitants or husband and wife team, that's it's risky. So when we have that type of arrangement, uh, you can't be lab partners. You got to work with somebody else or alone. <clears throat> uh, but there's detail in that that you might want to just look at, just read through, and you're you're probably uh, your ethics are probably sound enough that you don't even need to, to read it. Um, let's see, MS Word, if you're going to generate equations in your document, then this tells you how Microsoft Word enables your equation editor. I use a different one, I think, I, what is it called? Uh, uh, I can't remember, math type. I use math type, and generate my formulas and stuff and separate and then just paste them in. But uh, for simple equations, Word does okay. Um, these in black are like extra information. 
Uh, I'm looking to see if there's anything that should be in red. Nope, notebook format. Okay. Lab techniques. No, I was looking for a uh, sample notebook. Did I skip it? I don't see it in here. How to start and keep one. Ah, example lab notebook. There it is. Must have megabytes. <laughs> it's taking a while to load. Okay, so there's your cover. This student, I missed it. This student didn't have the semester and the year. So I wrote it there when I graded it and sent it back to him. I should have caught that. Student name, uh, course, and semester. And then we go down, there's the first page, right? They're all numbered, table of contents, and so forth. You, this is extra information. If you want to put the date here, that's fine. Uh, page numbers beginning and end, that's okay too. I'm not going to count off for that. And then notice we're skipping the even pages. We actually we're going to skip down to page five to start. There we go. So here's the first one molar mass by freezing point depression. This must be, this is actually 102. I think that's the first lab we do in Chem 102. But it follows the right format. See, there's your objectives, your materials, pre lab questions. Oh, what's missing? Safety. I missed that one too. There's no comment on safety. That needs to be in there. And this, the way this was written, uh, is probably not right. This, this said we feel we did something, and it should be. Do this, do this, do this. And then you only say what happened in the report. And you, you make comments here too, right? If something changes, cross, cross through it and put the real what happened. So this tells me one thing that I may not have caught. This student filled this thing out afterwards, after they did the experiment. Uh, okay, so we have a data section and the table was created with blank information. So this was blank, this was blank, that's blank, that's blank. And this information was only filled in during the lab. Well, it should have been. But now that I think about it, it might have been done afterwards. <laughs> but the, the concept is correct. Set up a place for your data so you know that you're looking for something, where it's supposed to go. Uh, procedures, there's second activity, okay. uh, cut and paste. Uh, here's another mistake that I didn't catch. When you cut and paste something into your lab notebook, uh, it's not wrong unless you don't do this. Initial it across the boundary so that if it falls out or somebody rips it out, you know it's missing. Now that doesn't recover it for you. But the only way to be sure is don't do that. You know, write it in your notebook. But you can do that. And I used to do that too for the, for the government when I kept a lab notebook. Uh, okay. So there's more data. More data. They've got a section of, of uh, reserved for it. And notice that these measurements of temperature were taken. Actually, right, what's missing? What units of, of temperature are those? They're probably Celsius, but you can't tell from this. And then we go down to the next odd page, and there are calculations. Shows how the calculations were done. If they're just a few calculations, then you can put them all in there. But if you have to do repetitive calculations, just show me one of them. Lab questions. Lab questions, these are post-lab. Okay. And then there should be a section on discussion, summary and discussion. That's missing too. 
I hope I graded the student down some for that. <laughs> so if you if you put all of that stuff in there in your lab notebook, then write the report is simple. You just the only thing you have to change is the grammar for the procedure, what was actually done. And the rest of it, you just lift it, type it into your report. So that, that should help minimize the distress, I hope, by doing it that way. Okay, um, maybe we ought to talk about, see, how much time have I wasted? 120. Okay, we have 15 minutes <laughs> and we can talk about the lab itself. So let me do this, close those tabs, and I'll just, uh, we're not gonna need this anymore. I'll shut it down. There we go. Well, let's talk about the, uh, about this lab. Uh, this lab is on graphing techniques. It actually speaks to the, uh, uh, one of the most powerful tools that scientists use to communicate their, uh, their uh, results of experiments is putting their data in some visual form. And that's what a graph is. It, it presents the data in a visual form that supports their argument. Because every published uh, experiment report that goes into one of these journals, uh, you assume that the uh, scientists or scientists that were involved uh, support the conclusions of that experiment. And then what you're looking for is, can they justify them? And this is one of the ways that you justify it by showing the way your data behaves under certain conditions. And that graphing is a good way to do that. Um, so this introductory material just talks about parts of a graph, right? If you've had geometry, or maybe they do it in algebra too, uh, algebra also, um, then you know the structure of a, of a table, right? The, the abscissa is the x-axis and the ordinate is the y-axis, right? You know how to I then locate a point on your graph. Right? You have a two-dimensional graph, then if this is x and this is y, then this point is going to be some x and some y. Uh, that's the value. And you have a bunch of them, right? Maybe you can relate them with, say, a line, like a straight line formula. So in this case, you would say uh, y, if you want to know what, what y is, then you would need the slope of the line and the value of x plus whatever the y intercept is. And then you can find out what y is. So x would be up here, and then this would tell you what y is. Okay. So we use straight lines. In, in this class often. I'm sorry? Yes. Yes, indeed. Right. It helps, it's that, that visual impact that helps you understand what um, Isaac Newton was getting at when he invented the stuff. Now, he wasn't the only one. Simultaneously, there was a, a German guy that or Leibniz. Yeah. 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 Calculus is, I, I haven't used it a lot over the years, but it was fun when I was taking it. Uh, okay. So that's the structure of your table. Right. So you need to read through that. And what types of relationships are there? There are inverse relationships and there's there are uh, direct relationships. So on your graph, if you graph your data and the trend is this direction, that's a direct relationship because as this one increases, that one increases. Right? This one is there. If you go over here, ah, bigger. It's also bigger there. That's direct proportion. Uh, it goes the other way, like this way. Then as this one gets bigger, that one gets smaller. That's an inverse relationship. So graphing can show you that immediately. So the slope of, of the first one was positive and the slope of the second one was negative. Uh, let's see. 
the, the sample they use in here, uh, the first actual graph that's drawn is, I'm sure this is based on uh, pressure volume relationships, boiled law. And you notice, and this is to emphasize the value of transformations. In other words, if you have a set of data for oils, it'd be pressure and volume. You have numbers here that relate to one another. As the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. So that's an inverse relationship. But if you draw them on a graph, what do you get? Uh, pressure, volume. You get like that. That's a hyperbola. So, and scientists generally hate curves because they're so difficult to model mathematically. Uh, in real life, they don't behave as, as well as you might get in math class. So we try to make straight lines wherever possible. And what we do is transform. So if we transform this to one over the, so we take these numbers and just take the inverse of them, right? Then we plot this one against the inverse. And if you do that, get a straight line. Now, when we get to discussing gases and Boyle's law, I'll explain why that is. But right now, I don't want to take the time to do it. Okay. Uh, what are other samples? All right. We've got some complex graphs in here, like the sigmoid curve. This is a, probably a titration curve for an acid base reaction. Um, just recognize that, that curves come in all shapes and sizes, they're even broken. Uh, plots like this one. It goes on for a while and then it stops and moves up here and goes on some more. So that's why I've, I've broken the, the actual exercise into two parts the required and the bonus section. So the required section uh, keeps you in fairly familiar territory. And then the bonus section goes into some of those oddballs, like the uh, sigmoid curve and the broken, the broken plots. You can do them if you want. There's no penalty for trying them. Uh, and if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have time, then you know leave them out. Because uh, when we get to uh, say that sigmoid curve, let's see, did we do that in this class? Acid-base reaction. A second semester. <laughs> okay, so if you come back for the for the next show, um, we'll do acid based titrations, and then I'll show you how that curve works, why it works, and how it relates to the concept called buffers. Okay, so any questions so far? I know I've breezed through that pretty fast. You've got some graph paper back here. I hope I think I gave you enough. To do all the plots. But if you feel uncomfortable, you think you might want to mess one up, then maybe you could photocopy it. Are you writing anything in the notebook for this lab? That's a good question. I don't think you have to do this one. Yeah. The second one. Uh, let's let's reserve the notebook for the second one because there we're actually going to go into the lab and do something, and there you need to be prepared. But for this one, this is just getting experience with graphing techniques. In fact, the reason I pulled this one out and I didn't do the um, Excel lab, well, last time I taught this course here, we went down to the uh, computer lab, and everybody had their computer, and I had one, and, the, and I pulled Excel up. And we had another lab that we went through and I showed you how to do your data in Excel and draw graphs with it. But I found that uh, most students are not proficient with graphing enough to where that made sense. So we need to do this one first. And then if you want to use this information to draw graphs in Excel and you've never done it before, I can show you that. So I think I was, I was jumping a step before. Okay, any questions? 
Okay, so you want to probably one of the first things you want to do if you don't already know the symbols is start memorizing, making your cards, memorizing those symbols. And then uh, uh, chapter two next week, we'll get into um, naming compounds. Don't miss the opportunity. Extra credit here. It takes time to, to grade them, but I think it's worth it.